Okay, everyone, welcome. We're just uh, waiting for a few people to arrive. Uh, so by now, you should have downloaded the uh, Python for Braille and Maths and Beyond uh, booklet, which is available on the uh, web website. Just let me show you where the website is. So if you go to the IMA uh, conferences, the conferences page, uh, and then you'll see the online workshop is here. And you can download these Python workshop notes under this requirements uh, paragraph here. Okay, so that, that's where we download uh, the, the booklet. Um, I think Maya has muted you all. So what I do periodically is I will stop sharing the screen and I will check the chat window. So, so you, you know, if you get a bit stuck, stuck or lost, you can put your questions in the chat window and I will answer those as we go along. Uh, what, just while we're waiting to start, you do, you do need to download Anaconda, uh, which, which was in the instructions here. So you need to download Anaconda, and then we're going to launch Spider. So, so when, you, when you've downloaded Anaconda, you can see Spider is here. You, you might have a different version of Spider, but that's what we'll be using this morning. So you just click on launch for spider, then you get this, you get the uh, spider uh, windows here. And I'll, I'll explain what those are uh, in a moment. Oh, we've got one in the chat. Um, welcome. Yeah, okay, welcome everyone. Yeah, so there is the, the link, uh, Maya's put the link to the IMA pages on the chat window. Um, so, we do that. So I'll just say welcome everyone in the chat window. Make sure you can all read that. Okay, so I'll just put that in the chat window. So as I say, if you, if you do have any burning questions as we go through the workshop, you can just put them there. Uh, during the workshop, I also ask you some simple questions just to see if you're understanding what I'm doing. And again, I will ask you to put your answers in the chat window. Okay, so it's now gone 12 o'clock. Um, let me just see how many parts. Well, we have 21. I think we were expecting a lot more than 21. So we'll just give it another four minutes for late arrivals. Does anybody have any quick questions before we start? I think you put your, put your questions in the chat window. And I can answer those. Uh, but currently we have 21 partic participants. And I think we were expecting about 36 or 40. Okay, or you just want to say hello, you can say hello in the chat window. So on the right hand side of the, your screen, uh, I, I put down the notes, you know, so you, you can put these notes that you can download through the IMA website. Uh, and then if you open the spider window, uh, so the spider we're going to have on the left hand side of the page. Twenty-two participants. Okay, and I'm sure more people will join as we go through the morning. Okay, so I'll, I'll make a slow start then, and uh, people can catch up as they come in. Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Stephen. Uh, I've been teaching mathematics now for a very long time, and I've been using these maths packages since the mid 1980s. So I've written books on Maple. MATLAB, Mathematica, and more recently, I've written lots of books on Python. So I've got a few more books uh, in the pipeline as well. So I'll, I'll say more about my books a bit later on. So my name's Stephen, so you can call me Stephen in the chat window. Uh, so this is a one day intensive workshop uh, and it's Python for A-level mathematics and beyond. So I'll show you how you can use Python for A-level maths, but I'll also show you if you go to university, uh, and even if you just don't do maths, if you do engineering, any other subjects, STEM subjects, uh, more and more universities are introducing Python into their curricula. Okay, so Python is a high level technical computing language and supports functional, imperative, object oriented, and procedural styles of programming. And it was developed by Guido van Rossum 
and first released in 1991. Uh, and we'll be using Python to help you with your A level maths and further maths. Uh, and you'll be able to find, you'll be able to find Python extremely useful when studying chemistry, biology, physics, and I would say, I would even say you know humanities subjects, business subjects. They will all be using Python in the future. Okay, so below is the cover sheet for the uh, maths education innovation. Um, well, th there's a website here, but the yeah, maths education innovation um, body. And Tom Button is the MEI's maths technology specialist. Uh, it's technological professional development. Uh, you may see on, on the web, they the MEI have developed some Python material Python materials for an introduction to data science. So if anyone wants to know more about data science, the MEI, uh, and there's a web link here, have produced free online resources uh, with Python for data science. Okay. And as you see here, here's a picture of me. Uh, so I'm, I'm a world leader in the use of maths packages, especially Python, MATLAB, MATLAB, uh, Maple, and Mathematica. Um, and on the right-hand side here, you can see the syllabus that have been listed by the MEI. So on the left-hand side, generally every school in the country teaches these subjects in the first year of the A-level maths syllabus. And then they go on in the second year, they teach uh, the second column material. Now at, at your school, if, you, if you're a student or a teacher, you may, you know, you may vary the content uh, from year to year. So each school may do the content uh, differently. But since 2017, there is now a common A-level mathematics core that all schools have to use. So all of you who are doing A-level maths or teaching A-level maths or have done A-level maths in the, in the past, these are now the core subjects which have to be studied uh, at A-level. Okay, let's see if there's any questions. Not, nobody's put anything in the chat window. Uh, we've now got 23 participants, so okay, that's not good. Okay, so in order to access Python, as I say, it's, it's on the web pages, but I'll give you a few minutes. So there is a link here at the top of page two, uh, the, and this is where we download Anaconda. Okay, so this is where we download uh, Anaconda in order to use not just Python, but you can use R for statistics, and there are lots of uh, data science packages as well. Uh, but we're going to be using Spider, and you can see once you've downloaded the Anaconda Navigator, then you'll see one of the one of the panes here is for Spider. And again, you might have a different version here, but then you just click, click on Launch Spider, and it should open this window on the left hand side. I should make it clear as well that once you launch Spider, unfortunately, it can take a few minutes for your computer to you know to upload Spider. Uh, when we when we use this method using Anaconda, we are taking memory up on our computer. So later on, I'm going to show you how you can use Google Colab. And when you use Google Colab, you do not need any software on your computer at all. So Google Colab is becoming more and more popular with Python programs around the world because you do not need to load any software onto your computer. But obviously, you, you need access to the World Wide Web. And in order to use Google Colab, you do need a Google account. Okay, so I will show you that later on. Uh, and during one of the breaks, I, I will ask you to register with Google if you don't already have a Google account. Um, so it's, you assume that pupils and staff are familiar with either Windows, Mac, or Unix platforms. You know, you're, you're probably all using different types of computer. Uh, the good news is, you can download Anaconda onto any of those platforms. Uh, I should also stress at this stage that Python and Anaconda, all these packages are completely free. Okay, you don't have to pay any money to access any of these materials. So all of these packages are completely free to the user. Okay, so this is the Spider Integrated Development Environment. So Integrated Development Environment has this acronym IDE, and you'll hear a lot of computer scientists talk about IDEs. So this is the Integrated Development Environment, and SPIDER is an acronym 
for scientific Python development environment. So you can see we just uh, select certain letters and it spells out spider or spider with a Y and not an I. Uh, and when you click on the spider launch button, again, it, it can take a few minutes. Then this window, you know, these windows here open. You'll see on the left hand side, we have an editor window. And I'll show you that uh, in one of the later sessions. This is where we write programs. In the top right hand window, we have a variable explorer, help, plots, and files window. So again, we'll, we'll look at this in a bit more detail when we start running programs, et cetera. And the first, the first window we're going to concentrate on is this console window. So in our very first session, we are simply going to use Python as a calculator. And we only need this simple window here, which if you look on the right-hand side is this window. Okay, and I'm gonna show you in a few minutes how you can undock. So you'll notice there's, there are three horizontal lines in the top right corner. If you click on that, we are going to undock the console window, okay? Because we don't need the files and we don't need the help variable explorer plots or files. So in the first session, I will show you how you can use Python as a simple calculator. And when you talk to people in industry who've been using Python for a long time, this is the most common form of how you use Python. You just use it, you know, as a as a calculator. And then later on, you know, when, when you want to write complex programs, that's when you use the editor window. But I've, I've spoken to people in industry, and a lot of people in industry say that, uh, you know, that they they use this, they do use this interactive window a lot uh, in their daily uh, work. Still, still no questions. So hope, hopefully, everybody's still managing to keep up. Okay, so the next uh, the next page, we've got the IPython console window, which is in the bottom right corner. So this will use Python as a graphing calculator. And the command prompt here, in one, is showing us that Python is waiting for input. Okay, and we'll have a look at that in, in a few minutes when we, when we look at the IPython console window. Uh, above this, we have the variable explorer help uh, plots and files window. So as I say, later on, when we start writing some simple programs, you can list your programs here and you can see the folders. And when we plot simple curves, you know, you can use the plots and you, you can see what the plots look like. And then finally, the editor window is on the left. And this is where you will write, you will write your Python code. So we're going to write some very, very simple Python programs. Okay, I, I do try to keep these uh, workshops as simple as possible. Okay, so what? Why should you be learning? Yeah, you know, what? Why are you doing this? This workshop? Why? Why should you, should you learn Python? Well, I did write an article for the IMA, uh, and you'll see there's a there is a link here. So this is an article I wrote in 2021. It was entitled Python for A Level Maths, Undergraduate Maths, and Employability. So in your own time, you know, you can read this in more detail. Uh, there are lots of programming languages uh, all around the world. So we have this uh, popularity of programming index and you will see quite clearly here, Python is by far the most popular programming language in the world. Okay, so th this is why, you know, we're, we're running this workshop in Python. And this is why I want all teachers and school pupils, in fact, I want everyone in the country to learn how to program in Python. Now, I'll say more about that uh, later on. Uh, you may have heard of Java and JavaScript. These are used by computer scientists a lot. Uh, C Sharp, C and C++, you may have heard of these. Uh, R, R is a statistical package. So, you know, if you do lots and lots of stats, you can use R. Uh, and then we've got all these, and then you see number 14, we have MATLAB. Okay, so at my university, we teach our students Python, R, and MATLAB. So we have a lot of, a lot of our graduates leave with a first class honors degree, and they are expert programmers in Python, MATLAB, uh, and R, and this makes them extremely employable. So you'll see here, put up, put up on here, programming makes you extremely employable. 
Uh, and we know this from anecdotal evidence from our students. Um, then we've got uh, which programming should a mathematician learn? Uh, luckily for you, Python is, is well, it's obviously the cheapest package you can use. Well, yeah, you have to pay for MATLAB, you have to pay for Maple, you have to pay for Mathematica, or your university has to pay for those packages. But all of Python is complete, completely free. Uh, how do I get hold of Python? Uh, today I'm going to show you through Anaconda and through Google Colab. But there are many, many different ways to access Python. Okay, so you can, uh, yeah, Octave is free too. Yeah, well, well done, David. Yeah, there are, there are quite a few free packages, uh, but, but Python is by far the most popular. And it's very powerful. Hopefully by the end of today, you'll see it's very, very good for mathematics. I'm not, I'm not sure, David, whether Octave is suitable for mathematics. Uh, how do you learn Python for maths? Uh, so here, you know, I, I, re I recommend this workshop just, just to start with. Um, will I need Python at university? A lot of students currently do not need Python, but in the future, you know, students will undoubtedly need, need to learn how to program, uh, and they'll probably need to learn how to program with Python. It's becoming more and more popular in every university around the world. Will Python help me with employability? Uh, well, we've got a, there is a, a web page dedicated to Python success stories. And again, in your own time, you know, you can read through this and you can see all of the lists of jobs which are available if you can program in Python. Okay, so that's that's uh, you know, so that's an article I wrote for, for the INA for careers. Oh, Octave is very similar to MATLAB. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so Python makes you extremely employable. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize, Python can be fun. Programming can be fun. Yeah, Excel integration is another benefit with Octave. Yeah, you can, you can also integrate Excel with Python. Okay, uh, hopefully by the end of today, again, you will see that uh, programming can be fun. Hopefully you'll all see that. Uh, if you're doing A-level maths, yeah, if you're doing A-level maths, then you know, obviously you can check. So obviously in order to pass A-level maths, you have to be able to do the work by hand. But a lot of students are given problems, you know, they, they write down the solution and straight away they, they think, well, am I correct or not? They don't know if they are if their solution is correct. So you can check your work with Python. Okay, so Python enables you can, to check your work. Uh, you can also make up your own examples. So for example, you know, if you're doing integration by parts, You've done all of the examples given by your teacher and you can do them all. Well, then you can make up your own examples and get the solutions and try them by hand. Uh, we can solve real world problems. Now, this is a big one because, you know, for, for A level, I know you look at very simple real world problems, but when you, when you get jobs and you do research and you start looking at real world problems, you know, 98% of the time you need packages in order to solve real world problems. So programming is definitely needed uh, when we solve real world problems. And I can give you examples of that with my own research. Uh, obviously you can solve problems which are impossible without a computer. Uh, you can create very colorful graphics. And today I'm gonna show you how to create graphics, how to save it as a PNG, a TIFF, uh, JPEG. And I'll also show you how to change the resolution of the figures. Okay, so I'll show you how we can make some really pretty pictures, and I'm even going to show you how to produce some animations. Uh, you can label your graphs with Greek alphabet and with mathematical symbols using something called LaTeX, and I'll say something more about LaTeX uh, a bit later on. Okay, and Python will give you a deeper understanding of the mathematics. Okay, so this has been well proven that when when you have to prove you know, when you have to write programs for mathematics, it gives you a deeper understanding of the mathematics. Okay, now, title of this um, workshop is Python for A-level maths and beyond. So I've uh, quite a few years back now, I wrote a Jupyter notebook, and this afternoon, I'm going to show you how you can create your own Jupyter notebooks uh, and, and in Google Colab or in, um, you know, with Anaconda. Um, and then I'll also quickly show you how to use GitHub. So you'll notice this link here. 
you know, we've got Dr. Stephen Lynch, Doc GitHub. So I've saved all of my web, web pages in GitHub, which again is completely free. You don't have to pay people to create web pages for you. You can use GitHub, you know, to publish your own web pages. So I can give you an example of that. So if you click on this one, um, then it takes you to this website here. So you can see that the address is up here. So in GitHub, I've saved a load of HTML files, which are produced using Python. Yeah, so all of this is produced using Python and Jupyter Notebooks. And, and this afternoon, I'm going to show you how you can produce your own Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so again, this is the MEI syllabus, and these are all of the topics. Um, there's a little introduction here, and here are the topics. So, you know, if you're looking at CERDs and indices, uh, these are the kind of problems you have to answer at A-level mathematics. And you can see I've given simple cells. So these are called cells where we input the Python code. Uh, we, hit the, we hit a little play button or you hit shift enter. I'll show you all of this later on. Uh, and you can execute the code and get the answers. Okay, so for example, you know, we, we can plot quadratic curves. Uh, we can solve inequalities. We can do coordinate geometry, you know, at, at A level, quite often you ask, you know, where, where is the tangent to a point on a circle? So we can plot, actually plot that, see what it looks like. Obviously we can plot trigonometric functions and we can see what happens when we change the amplitude, when we change the phase, when we change the frequency, et cetera. Uh, we can expand and factorize polynomials. Uh, we can do animations. Now look at this, I'll just, show you this on the So this afternoon, I am going to show you how you produce this animation. Yeah. So we will see here, we're on a loop. Yeah, so was, this is showing you how sine omega t, omega t changes as the frequency of sine omega t changes. So we're changing the frequency of a sine wave. Now we can either loop or we can reflect. So this is very, you know, this is very, really useful for mathematics because quite often we have parameters which are increasing and decreasing. So in this case here, we are increasing the frequency. You can see the sine wave squashes. And then we see, well, what happens if you decrease the sine wave? And then you can see it spreads out again. Okay, so, so we can increase and decrease. And imagine if, you, if, if we've got any teachers on, on, the, on this workshop, you can actually get students to come to the front and they can just move the slider left and right. Yeah, so you could say to them, you know, before looking at this, you could say, well, you all know what the sine wave looks like, but what happens when we increase the frequency? And what happens when we decrease the frequency? So you can see these are very interactive plots. Um, a, lot of, a lot of students and teachers say to me, you know, you can do this in Desmos. You know, why, why should I learn to program in Python when I could just, do this in Desmos or, you know, or some of these other packages. Well, I'm afraid when you go for job interviews, no interviewer is ever going to say to you, do you know Desmos? Okay, that it's not, it's not, uh, you know, using, using apps is not going to make you employable. But what they will ask you is, can you write a program to produce an app? And that's what employers are after. Okay, so that's why Python programming is so highly sought after. Uh, Alexandra is saying that the notebook looks a lot like Mat MATLAB Live Scripts. Yes, Alexandra, it's very, very similar to MATLAB Live Scripts. You, you are correct. Okay, so again, in your own time, you know, you can you can uh, have a look at all of these examples. Uh, you can do statistics, uh, hypothesis testing, proof. A uh, proof is an interesting one. Uh, I'll come back to that later on. Um, uh, you can differentiate, you can integrate, you can work with vectors. Uh, we can solve differential equations. So if any of you are in the upper sixth form, you know, in the, the second year of your sixth form, you might look, you might have been introduced to differential equations. So here is a very simple model of the spread of flu in a school. Yeah, so we, we've got 1,000 pupils in this school and one student comes in with the flu. Yeah, and you can see, you know, you've got, uh, rates of infection and rates of recovery, etc., and we can plot a solution curve to see what the population of the susceptible, infected, and recovered pupils are in the school over a hundred days. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, the numerical methods. I know it's probably 
uh, really frustrating for you when you do numerical methods with your calculator. You know, you have to sit there for ages pushing a button, pushing a button. Uh, but with Python, we can write simple programs. And in the real world, you know, when, when we use numerical methods, you would never use a calculator. Yeah, you would never use a calculator to do numerical methods. In the real world, we write programs. Uh, so here is a simple program uh, in order to find a root of this cubic polynomial uh, starting with a seed of x naught is two. Uh, yeah, x naught is two. And you can see very quickly, you know, well, we've, we've got 22 iterates here. So you can imagine how boring this would be at A level, pushing a button on your calculator 22 times. And you can imagine, you know, sometimes when we iterate, we want to iterate 100 times or 1,000 times or 100,000 times. So this is why we need programs. Uh, towards the end, then, we've got our uh, moments, projectiles. You know, here's, here's the uh, trajectory of a projectile. We can also produce an animation. You know, so in this case, a ball is thrown from the top of a cliff. Uh, but if we wanted to, we can produce an animation showing the flight of the ball uh, launched from the top of a cliff. Uh, and we do. Okay, so that, that's just giving you uh, a quick taste of that. Okay. Uh, I can just quickly plug my book. So I've just written a book, Python for Scientific Computing and Artificial Intelligence. The first section of this book covers a very simple introduction to Python and also Python for AS level maths and Python for A level maths. Okay, and then it goes on to scientific computing, uh, covering biology, chemistry, computer science, data science, electrical and mechanical engineering, economics, maths, physics, stats, and binary oscillator computing. And then also in the final section, we cover artificial intelligence, and, you know, artificial neural networks, et cetera. Okay, so let's just go now. Okay, so hopefully now we now have 25 participants. Okay, uh, I'm hoping you've all managed to open up Spider. So now we are going to go through uh, this Python tutorial one. Okay. So we're going to go through Python tutorial one, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. Okay. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have Spider. Now, if you've just opened Spider, uh, all of you probably see, well, when you first open Spider, it's black. Yeah, the background is black. If you want to change the preferences, so if you click on, you know, click on this window, if you go to Python preferences, yeah, Python preferences and we can click on Spider Dark, or I've just taken Spider. You can see my version is Spider. There's lots of other, you know, um, there's lots of other uh, options here as well. I've got Spider because I like a I like a white background, or the default is Spider Dark, and this is where you have a black background. Now it's up to you. You can either work in light mode or dark mode. I usually find with delegates that computer scientists like the dark mode and mathematicians like the light mode. I don't know why, but that seems to be uh, the trend. Okay, so I'm working in light mode, or you can work in dark mode. If any of you have difficulty uh, with font sizes, this is where you can also change the font size um, you know, of, of the windows you know, of, of when, you, when you're typing. So if you want to, you can change the, you know, change the font size, apply, and okay, so you can see hopefully my font size is quite large, okay, because I, I, I want you to be able to see it. Uh, you'll see there are lots of other preferences as well. Now, I could spend hours and hours just going through all of this, okay, but we haven't got time. But you can play around with this in your own time later on. Okay, so that here is our spider uh, windows. We are going to use the, um, the console window. So as I say, in the top right-hand corner of the console window, we're going to click and we are going to undock. Can you all see that? We are going to undock the console window. Oh, Sharon is saying, still downloading for me for the past hour. Right, Sharon, for, if any of you are having difficulty downloading Spider, don't worry. I will show you how to uh, open this up in Google Colab. Okay, so, so Sharon, you will see straight away the benefits yeah, worst case. Okay, or you can use Google Colab. Sharon, do you have Google, a Google account? Does Sharon have a Google account? Yes. Okay, Sharon, 
I will I will show you in a second how to open up Google Colab. And for any anybody else who's having difficulties with Spider, some of you may have old computers, you know, and, and it's difficulty getting. Okay, Taro, yeah, don't worry. You can do everything I'm going to do now. We can do a Google Colab. So I will show you how to do this in Google Colab. Okay, for the rest of you, if you undock, undock the uh, console window, and we're just going to have it alongside uh, the notes. Okay, so so for all of you, you know, just get to this stage. Um, so we want the IPython console window on the left, and we want our notes on the right. Can you use it through a shell terminal? Yes. Yes, you can use it through a shell or a terminal. Right, for those of you who have difficulties with Spider, if you go to uh, the World Wide Web, uh, and we are going to just, in Google, okay, so I'll just give you all a few seconds for this. You know, if you go to your Google search engine, don't worry, if you've opened up Spider, do not do this. This is just for the people who are having difficulty with Spider. So in Google, simply type Google Colab. And, and as I say, you need you need a um, Google account in order to do this. Okay, so you just click on the first link. Um, you can see I'm already logged in, but some of you might have to log into your Google account. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to click on this this uh, tab here. It says New Notebook. You'll see it says New Notebook. So we're going to click on New Notebook. And a Jupyter notebook opens up in Google. Uh, in order to connect online, uh, we're going to connect to a hosted runtime at the top. You'll see connect, connect to a hosted runtime. It says connecting. Uh, and hopefully within a few seconds, okay, here. Okay, so you should have this symbol here. So this now means that we are ready to use uh, Google Colab on the cloud. So this is cloud computing. Okay, so let me just show you the first few commands. Okay, so if you're in Spider, I'll, I'll come back to Spider in a second. Well, after in one, we simply type the hash symbol, and then this is a comment. Okay, and then we hit this little play button. You either hit Shift Enter, Shift Enter executes the cell, or you just hit the little play button. And you'll see it's ticked. Okay, it's executed that command. Now let me just show you in Spider. Okay, so I will I will carry on in Spider. I'm just showing for those people who uh, can't get Spider. So we in Spider we just type this is a comment, comment, and then hit return. Okay, and you can see that. Uh, this version of Python seems to be incorrectly compiled. Okay, I don't know what that. Okay, I think it worked. Let, let's try the next one. Four plus five, take away three. Hit return. Okay, it's working. Okay, I don't know what that was up there. Okay, but we've done four plus five, take away three. For those of you on Google Colab, if you just, we, we're going to add a code cell. So you just click on code. Uh, and we want four plus five, take away three. Now, straight away, you're probably all thinking, why is he leaving gaps? Yeah, you're probably thinking, why am I leaving gaps between these operators? And the simple reason is it makes code look pretty. So all Python programmers around the world have agreed that leaving gaps between the operators makes the code look prettier. That's the simple reason. Okay, now again, in this shell window, we hit shift enter. Okay, so we hit shift enter or hit the little play button. And you can see it gives us the correct answer. Four plus five, take away three, is equal to six. Okay, so Spider, Spider, and Google Hull are agree. Uh, I can't work out how to undock in Spider, but I guess I can use the console. Yes, David, you can just use the console. Let, let me redock again, just to show you again. Let's dock that back in again. Okay, so uh, David, um, yeah, you got your windows here. There's a little, the three little horizontal buttons in the top right corner. It says options, and we just undock. Can you see near the bottom? It says undock. So we just undock, and we undock the console. And so it just makes it easier to work with. Uh, but it's not reading. Yeah, Blanca is saying, do we need to leave the spaces? No, Blanca, you do not need to leave the spaces. 
But you know, all Python programmers around the world will expect you to leave the spaces. They will expect you to leave spaces. So if you share your code with people, they will expect you to leave spaces. Okay. Okay. The next one is how do you multiply, multiply, and divide? So you'll notice we use asterisk to multiply, and we use a forward slash to divide. So two multiplied by three is six, divided by six gives us the answer one. Okay, and you see the answer is 1.0. And that's because the default with all of these computers is they do floating point arithmetic. Okay, and this can cause us problems. And I'll explain more about this later on. Okay, but computers work with floating point arithmetic, which can cause problems. Okay, how do we do exponentiation? Well, in Python, it's double asterisk. And you'll notice when we use double asterisk, we do not leave gaps. Okay, and you're probably all screaming at the screen saying, you've just said we leave gaps. Well, all Python programmers around the world uh, think that when you do exponentiation, you should not leave gaps. Okay, again, it makes the code look easier to read. It's just easier to read if you don't leave, leave gaps with exponentiation. So two, asterisk, asterisk eight means two to the power eight, which I'm sure you'll know is two times two times two times two, eight times. And that gives us the answer, 256. Uh, Victoria is saying shift enter isn't working. I can't find the play button. Could you demonstrate that again, please? Yeah, okay, so Victoria. Uh, if you've opened Google Colab, you know, you should, you should get your cells like this and there should be a little play button to the left of the cell. Oh, she's on spider. Yeah. Victoria, you just hit return. Sorry. In spider, you don't hit shift enter. You just hit return. Yeah. So you just hit return. There's no need to do shift enter in spider. So in spider, it's simply return. And when you're in Google Colab, when you use Jupyter Notebooks, it's shift return. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay, Victoria? You just, you just hit return in spider. Okay, I think she's managed to do that. Okay, next we are going to import our first. Okay, we're going to import our first library or module. So these are called libraries or modules. So we're going to import the math library. Now it looks like nothing's happened, but in the background, the math library has been loaded. So we now type help math. And you'll notice that you know Spider is really good because it's kind of showing you uh, what you're typing. You know, it gives gives you help. So if you type help math, then it lists all of the functions available in the math library. Okay, so the, this is the module or library reference. You may have heard of a lot of these functions: a cos, a cosh, um, cos, degrees. Uh, exp, factorial, um, what else is here? Uh, is NAN, uh, LCM, uh, log, log base two, uh, radians, sine, tan, etc. Okay. Yep. So you can see there are lots of functions in there. Now I will explain what these functions are a bit later on. And I'll even show you how, how you define your own functions. Uh, Blanca is saying this only works with reals, right? No, Blanca, uh, we can work with complex numbers, okay? Later on, I might show you some complex numbers. Yeah, but you can, yeah, you can do complex numbers in Python. Okay, so our next one, now we've loaded the math library, we can call the functions within the math library by using this prefix math dot. Okay, so we want to use the function sqrt, and you'll see as, as we type the function, you see that this returns the square root of x. So x is our, you know, our the variable that we're putting in. So here, x is 9. So we want the square root of 9. We get, and it, this only gives us the positive root. Okay, so this is like the, you know, the third form of the root. So we only get the positive root, which is 3. Yeah, so it doesn't give us the plus or minus. So the SQRT function only gives us the uh, positive root. Uh, now, you know, if you don't want to keep on using the prefix math dot, 
sign, math doc, cos, etc. You know, it's too much typing. Then what we can do instead is from math, we can import all the functions. Okay, so let me just put a comment here, import all functions. Now, you can see here, I am using a comment. Yeah, I'm using a comment. The comment symbol is the, I'd say this is the most important symbol of any programming language. Because later on, when we come to write programs, these comments are extremely useful because you can remind yourself, you know, what each line of your code does. So, so I get I get my students to use the comments a lot in their programs. And, and I need to use this a lot to remind myself what certain parts of programs are doing. Yeah, so Python ignores everything after the hash symbol. So again, we just hit return. And you'll see we've now imported all of the functions from the math library. Uh, Blanca is saying, so writing a program, would you do that import with the star or? Yes, Blanca, you can either import all of the functions or you can just import the functions that you need. Uh, Sharon is getting an error. Math is not defined. Uh, Sharon, just make sure. Uh, well, try, try this command, Sharon, from math import star. Yeah, from math import star. So that imports all the functions. So for example, then we can say factorial 52. Yeah, so this, you know, this gives us 52 factorial, which is 52 times 51 times 50, etc. And here is 52 factorial. Now we love showing this to our students because if you take a normal deck of playing cards and give them a really good shuffle, this is the number of permutations of a normal deck of playing cards. So if you give a, a deck of playing cards a really good shuffle, the order of those cards is probably unique in the you know in the all in the history throughout the history of the human race. What happens if two important functions have the same name? Yeah, that, that's a good question, David. Okay, so there are protect, you know, so obviously Python has has got these functions, factorial, sin, plot, etc. Uh, if you define a function with the same name, you overwrite that. And this, this causes massive problems, for example, in examinations. Okay, so historically, I've had students in an exam who've defined a, a new function called plot, and then obviously the, the real plot function stops working. Yeah, so, so yeah, that's a very good uh, point, David. Uh, you can overwrite these function names, so you have to be very careful. Yeah, okay, uh, Sharon is saying the same error. Uh, you can see it does work, Sharon. Are you, are you in, are you in Spider, Sharon? You can, you can see it does work from math import star. No, are oh, you in Google Colab? Let me show you in Google Colab. So we do um, uh, from math import star. And then we do uh, what was it? Factorial, factorial uh, fifty-two. And then we hit the little play button. Remember? Okay. Can you see Sharon? It does work in in uh, Jupyter notebooks as well. Yeah. Can you see from math import star hit return to get this, and then you hit shift return to execute the cell. So you hit return to go to a new line. Shift return executes the cell. Okay, Sharon, so it does work in Spider and it does work in Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, so that was factorial. Uh, the next one we have sign. You know, you can do sign of 0 0.5. Uh, and you'll notice that here uh, we get the answer in radians. Okay, what, once you get to university level, uh, well, I can't remember. At A level, do you use radians or degrees? I can't remember. Uh, right. Well, anyway, you, you can convert. I'll show you how you can convert from one to the other. So we've got our trig functions. We can do the inverse sign. And so it's arc sign. Uh, Patrick, there probably, yeah, there probably is a built-in function of prime factors of an integer. I don't know it off the top of my head. Or you can even write your own program to do it if there isn't. Okay, so we can do arc sign 0.4794. So that's about 0.5. Uh, we have our log base A. So this is uh, natural uh, logs. 
So log is our natural log. So the natural log of two is that number. Uh, AS maths is degrees. Full A level has both degrees and ratings. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Been having a go, but can't hit on right name. Okay, that's log base two. Uh, what do we have then? Then we, we also have log base 10. So log base 10 of 10 is obviously one. Uh, we could do the hyperbolic functions, cosh of 0.3. Uh, we could do exponentials, you know, x of 2. That's e to the power 2. We can also use e. Okay, so we can just do e squared. And you can see, now you can see the problems here. You can see we've got slightly different numbers. You know, so x2 as a function gives us a slightly different uh, answer to e squared. Okay, and, and already now you can see you start to get problems with floating point arithmetic. Okay, so that's e squared. So, uh, you know, um, Python does know what e is in the math library. Yeah, so it knows what e is. Uh, we could also do fractions, one third, one third uh, plus one quarter. And you can see we get the answer 0 0.583333, uh, which again is a floating point number. Okay, one third plus one quarter is not 0 0.583333333. Okay, it's something else. So we can do we can also do something called uh, symbolic computation, and this is this is becoming more and more important in the real world. Okay, so from from the fractions library, we are going to import a function called fraction. So we can do fraction. So fraction is now a function. And it has two arguments. The first argument, I'm sure you all have guessed, is the numerator. The second argument is the denominator. Okay, so fraction one comma three represents the exact fraction one third. And we're gonna add fraction, and this is the exact fraction, the numerator comma denominator. Okay, so we're adding the fraction a third to the fraction one quarter. And obviously, you know, if you do this, you'll see you should get the, the exact fraction seven twelfths. And you can see that seven twelfths is not the same as 0 0.58 this number. Okay, these two numbers are not the same. How do you know they're not the same? Because we can do out 19. So we can work with diff, you know with the output. We can do out 19, take away out 18. Uh, sorry, out um, 17 it was, wasn't it? Yeah, so we can do out 19, take away out 17. Now can you see this? It's not zero. Yeah, so using floating point arithmetic, one third plus a quarter gives us a number. Yeah. And with symbolic computation, we get the exact answer. And you can see if you subtract the two, there's an error. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, it's not zero. Uh, yeah. Fun yeah. JP Hall. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, functions are case sensitive. So, fraction with a capital F is not the same as fraction with a little f. So, the fractions library is with a little f, or uh, fraction the function is um, uh, Patrick saying, what's going on if you do fraction one ninth plus fraction one the eleventh? Uh, does that give you the right answer, Patrick? Uh, well, we'll come back to that if we, if we have time at the end. Okay, next one. So we want the floor function. So suppose we want floor of 2.456. Now, again, you'll see Python's trying to help us uh, so the, this returns the floor of x as an integer, and it's the largest integer less than or equal to the real number uh, x. Okay, so if you think about this, you know what, what's the largest integer less than or equal to 2.456? You know, what's the largest integer less than or equal to 2.456? And the answer is 2. Now, again, this is one of those concepts which is quite difficult to get over to students, floor and ceiling functions. Uh, so again, this is where Python can help because you, know, you just make up your own examples, make up your own examples until you understand what these things do. Okay, there's also a ceiling function, seal. So the seal gives us the smallest integer greater than or equal to 2.456. Okay, there's ceiling, which gives us three. Um, and then we've got the truncating function. Okay, so if we truncate, if 
5.645, then it truncates towards zero. Okay, so if we truncate 5.645, then we go towards zero, so that gives us five. If you use the up arrow key, we can return to earlier lines. Can you see this? Using the up arrow key, we can go back or forward. Okay, so rather than retype, we can just go up, and suppose we want trunk of minus 5.645. Okay, and you'll see that's minus five. Okay, so we 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 move towards zero. So on the real line, yeah, David, yeah, you'll probably see that this this does look very similar to Mathematica. Is this a syntax? Oh, Gemma, I'll, I'll I'll come back to the fractions one in a bit. Okay, uh, trunk because I need I need to finish this tutorial. Uh, trunk of that. Uh, next one was degrees. Okay, so you, you'll see that this converts from radians to degrees. So if we want to know what is 0.5 uh, radians in degrees, then it's 28.64788 uh, degrees. Uh, so now I'll ask you all to put in the in the um put in the um chat window. Okay, what do you think the command is? For converting from degrees to radians. Yeah. What do you think the command is to convert from degrees to radians? So just put your put the put the command in the chat window. How do you convert from degrees to radians? Okay, so I can see you, but you've all had a guess. Okay, so well, you know, you, what you probably do is oh, let's just try radians. And Again, Python is trying to help us here. So you can see, you know, straight away we've put in the function radians, and there is a function called radians, and it does in it does indeed convert from degrees to radians. I think somebody said deg deg to rad. If we tried deg to rad, you see there's no no function. Python doesn't recognize a function called deg to rad. But if you wanted to, JP Horton, you could write your own function called deg to rad. Yeah, it's up to you. Okay, so the function is called radians. Okay, so uh, let's say what you know what is um, from radian from degrees to radians. So let's say what is 180 degrees, and you can see it's a, it's about pi. Yeah, 180 degrees is 3.141, etc. So it's about pi. Again, we've got floating point arithmetic, so it's not exact. Okay, so that's true. But then we can do modulo arithmetic. So we've got f mod 13, comma 6. Uh, so uh, this is very important uh, in cryptography. Okay, so we, we use modulo arithmetic a lot in cryptography. So this is 13 mod 6. So 13 mod 6 gives us 1. Uh, we can also do, uh, what is the meaning of forward slash in function definitions? Function definitions. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute, David. Um, then we've got uh, GCD. So GCD obviously stands for greatest common divisor. We have the greatest common divisor of one, two, three, and three, two, one. Then you see the answer is three. Now again, in the chat window, what do you think the function is to find lowest common multiple? Again, just put your answers in the chat window. How do you think Python programmers have labeled the function lowest common multiple. Okay, so you're all getting the hang of this now. Okay, LCM. So if we wanted to, we could work out the lowest common multiple of say uh, five, uh, eight, and 35. Yeah. Yeah, so what is the lowest common multiple of five, eight, and 35? You see the answer is 280. And again, you can, you can make up your own example. So LCM, is the correct function to find lowest common multiple, or you can write your own function. Okay, so we're going to write, um, we can find the remainder, so 17 uh, remainder, uh, sorry, 17 yeah, divided by three gives, so this, the percentage gives us the remainder. So this gives remainder. Okay, so the percentage gives us the remainder. So if you divide 17 by three, then the remainder is two. So the percentage operator returns the remainder. Um, Python knows what pi is, you know, so there's pi, knows what pi is. 
Um, and then we can round, so there's a function called round, so we can round the last answer, which is underscore. Oh, where's underscore? Uh, underscore. So round underscore to, say, three decimal places. Uh, so, so underscore is just the last output. You know, we want to round the last output to three decimal places. Uh, Python knows what e is. Uh, it knows what tor is. So tor is just two pi. And then if we want to quit the IPython console, we simply type quit. Okay, and that, that, that restarts the kernel. So everything you've typed before is then forgotten. Yeah, so, so you clear your kernel. It's like clears out the memory. So is the net, yeah. Yeah, at AJD underscore is the same as the, well, it would have been out 31, but, but it, it just means the last out, the last output. How could you round to sig figs? Uh, Alexandra, I don't know off the top of my heart, uh, off the top of my head, but there will be, there probably will be a function that does significant figures. Okay, so you'll see we're just coming up to one o'clock and we're going to have our first break. So are there any questions to do with that first tutorial? Okay, so you see that was just a very simple introduction to uh, calculator commands. I think I think somebody was asking a question about uh, fractions and I think somebody else answered in the chat window. Uh, thank you. So uh, this is what I like with the workshop. If, if one of the other delegates can answer a question, then please feel free to answer the questions because it, it just saves time. Uh, I think somebody was putting, you know, a, a common mistake with fractions is, you know, you do one forward slash three uh, here. Okay, remember fraction is a function, so you have to enter arguments in the function, so it's separated by commas. Yeah, so when you're dealing with fra the fraction function, it's one comma three, not one divided by three. Okay, so I think that was where the error was. Okay, so um, look, yeah, we're coming up to one o'clock. Uh, no questions so far. Uh, Patrick says, I put one seventh inside frac. Yeah, okay, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I do say to my students, it's good to make mistakes because believe it or not, you learn more by making mistakes. Yeah. And that this this often happens in programming, yeah. So so don't worry if you do make mistakes. It is beneficial to you if you do make mistakes because you learn more. I know it sounds balmy, but you know it, you, you do learn more by making mistakes. I think it must be converting a rational props. Yeah, it's just I don't know what it is, Patrick. It's um, but it's it's not the function. Yeah, but Patrick, we should be using a function called fraction. Yeah, so something else is going on there, which I don't know what it is. Okay, so we're now going to have a short break. Um, and after the break, just let me show you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to have a, a coffee break. I'm going to make myself a hot drink. So we'll have a coffee break, and then we will we will resume at quarter past one. And you'll see at quarter past one, uh, you know, which again we're going to use a console window. And I'm going to introduce you to symbolic computation. Now, I know a lot of you on this workshop have probably done symbolic computation before, but you may not have done it, um, you know, in Python. Uh, I have a US keyboard. I can never get a pound sign. Uh, was, I can deal with. Yeah, there, David. Uh, if, you, if you look on, if you look on the web, I'm sure it'll tell you which key you need to need to uh, get the pound symbol or the hash symbol. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so you, you can easily find that answer, David, on, on the web. Okay, so af after this copy break, well, I'll introduce you to symbolic Python. Then we'll have a longer break. Then I'll introduce you to numerical Python and matplotlib, where we plot lots of pretty pictures, and we'll do some animation. Uh, no, animations is next. Uh, after the final copy break, that's when I introduce you to Python programming. I'll show you how to write your own Jupyter notebooks and how you can publish them on the web. Uh, we'll also use Google Colab in a bit more detail, um, uh, and again, you you know you can you can publish these I'll publish your web pages on the web through GitHub. I'll, I'll show you how you can do that if you want to. Okay, uh, has there, anybody got any questions? Yeah, so help maths. You get it with the option. Here. 
do we get any sort of certificate on completion of this workshop? I'm sorry, Nisha, uh, you don't get a certificate. Um, but obviously, you know, it's being recorded. This is being recorded. And I think the IMA will share the recording with you, um, you know, once you've completed this workshop. I must, I must stress, Nisha, that this is a really, really simple introduction to Python. Okay. Um, you know, it's... If, if you're going for a job interview, uh, the level of Python you're living, you know, you 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 that you're learning here is only really suitable for A level maths. It's, it wouldn't get you a job as a Python programmer. Um, all right, David. Yeah, okay. I think everyone's just helping each other. Okay, so it's now one o'clock. I say we'll have a break. I'll I'll switch off my microphone. In fact, I'll stop sharing the screen. Um, and we will return at uh, well, I will return at one fifteen. So I will see you all again. I will see you all at one fifteen p.m. Okay, let me do a little smiley face. Oh, that was a little smiley face. Okay, there you go. Okay, I will see you all again at one fifteen. I put my sunglasses on, but. Uh, it's not very sunny here, so it's raining. Okay, so I'll see you all again at one fifteen. So I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen, um, and then we'll start again at one fifteen. So I'll, I'll be back at one fifteen.
Okay, we just have three minutes before we start. Anybody have any, any quick questions before we start? And you can put your answer, uh, questions in the uh, chat window. Anybody got any quick questions before we start on? Yeah, okay. Yeah, go on, Blanca. Yeah, Blanca, you can just put your, put your question in the chat. If I do one of the exercises, two times four to five, always factorial five. Yeah, remember, if you're calling the factorial function, Blanca, you need to load the math. You need to load the math library. Yeah, get that out. Everything loaded. Right. Yeah, you're, you're saying it's wrong, uh, but I do not get a numerical value. Numerical value. Okay. Yeah, late, later on, um, I, Blanca, I'll show you how to convert. Yeah, so you use a function called n. So you just, um, uh, you have to use simpy. Okay, but yeah, but you'll be able to do this later on. I'll show you how to do it later on. Uh, somebody was asking about a certificate. Um, uh, a certificate. Do we get any sort of certificate? Nature, uh, I think the IMA might give you a certificate. Okay, so um, we'll have to, you know, so certificates may be available through the IMA. Okay, but I'm not sure. Hi, it's just me. Um, if oh. you'd like a certificate, just ping conferences at ima.org.uk. Oh, thanks, Maria. And I'll be able to pull you a certi certificate of attendance. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Maria. Okay, Nasha. Uh, Nasha. Yeah, this Nasha was asking it. Yeah, Nasha. Uh, so you can get you can get a certificate from the IMA. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Maria. Okay, it's now quarter past, so we'll start on the uh, tutorial two, which is uh, on page five of 17. So I'll give you all a few seconds to get to page five. So now we are going to carry out symbolic computation um, using, um, using Python. Okay, so we're gonna quit the console window from before. Uh, and you'll see we've now um, restarted the curve. Okay, so we've got n1 again. Okay, so we want to use the, our uh, functions from the symbolic library. So from SymPy, which is a library or module, we are going to import all of the functions. Okay, so remember, this means import all functions. Okay, so we hit the return key, um, and uh, I think just ignore that error message. I don't know why, given that. So it should import all of the uh, functions from symbolic plan. So we're going to work with X and Y symbols. So we're going to uh, tell Python that these are going to be symbolic objects. Um, so we use, well, you can use single dits or double quotes. I use it's better to use double quotes because when you, if you copy and paste, uh, you know, lines, uh, single quotes can cause problems. Okay, so I will say always use double quotes. Well, you, you'll, you know, you'll see um, some some Python programmers like using single quotes, but there is a problem if you highlight the text and copy and paste. Um, it gets confused with the, you know, with, with the uh, quotes. So always use double quotes from now on. Um, so the infinity U type, yeah. Okay, uh, Blanca, I think you're you're rushing ahead, Blanca. Just stick stick with me. You know, don't don't go too far ahead. Okay, so X and Y are going to be symbolic objects. So in order to factorize, 
somebody has written a, a function called factor. Okay, you could have, you know, you can again, you can create your own function and call it factorize, or um, you know, it, within SymPy, the function is called factor. So we use factor to factorize. So we can factorize x squared, take away y squared. Again, in the back, 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 back. right. Don't we just hit the return key. So x squared minus y squared factorized is x minus y multiplied x plus y. Uh, we can also solve. Okay, solve um, an equation. So we're going to solve a quadratic equation. Solve x squared minus 4 multiplied by x and then take away 3. And we're going to solve 4x. Yeah, so we want to solve this. And notice here we do not type. You don't have. You don't have to include equal zero. Okay, so this is x squared minus four x minus three equals zero. Okay, but in 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 this solve function, you do not have to type equal zero. Okay, so and you'll see it gives you the answer in third form, which is the answer you want at any level. Yeah, so if we solve the quadratic equation, x squared minus 4x minus 3 equals 0, then we get two roots, and those roots are in third form. Okay, so that's solving the quadratic. We can also do partial fractions, okay, and we use a, a function called apart. Okay, so we want to split apart 1 over um, x plus 2 uh, multiplied by x plus 1. Now, this is where you have to make sure parentheses match up in correct pairs. But again, you'll see spider is helping us. You'll see this. As you type in the parentheses, they match up in green. So you can see you know, the parentheses do match up in correct pairs. Uh, Simon, could you solve an equation equal to non-zero? Yes, you can, Simon. Uh, you know, you can just subtract whatever is on the right hand side. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so a part, uh, you know, so we can split that into partial fractions. Um, then we can do, uh, we can simplify trig expressions. So there is a function called trig simp. So this reduced, returns a reduced expression using known trig identities. So, for example, cos of x take away. Uh, now, we have to be careful here. Uh, so, it's cos of x cubed. Okay, notice, you know, this, this is how, not how you would write it uh, at a level. You, know, you, you do cos to the power 3 of x. Okay, but in Python and in all programming languages, you have to do cos of x and then you cube the whole thing. Yeah, so it's not cos cubed x. Okay, uh, so cos of x take away cos cubed x is sine squared x times cos x. Okay, so that's, you know, simplified the trick. Uh, we can also perform limits. So we take the limit of x divided by sine of x, and then as x goes to zero. Okay, so this, this, is, this is the syntax to find limits. So this, this is the limit of x over sine x as x goes to zero. I can see you get the answer one, and this is the symbolic answer. Okay, this this is not this is not a um, floating point. This this gives us the exact answer one. Uh, we can also differentiate and integrate. So the function to differentiate, and it's the same in most programming languages, is diff. So we can differentiate x squared uh, take away seven multiplied by x plus eight, and we want to differentiate with respect to x. Okay, so we can differentiate with respect to x. We can also take higher order derivatives. So we can take the diff of 5 multiplied by x to the power 7 uh, with respect to x three times. Yeah, so we can differentiate 5x to the 7 three times. So this, this is d3 dx cubed of that. Yeah, so you can do higher order derivatives. Uh, we can also we can also do partial differentiation. So if any of you are doing, I think they do it in further maths A level, don't they? So diff, you can you know you can differentiate, say, four multiplied by x to the power five multiplied by y to the power eight. Uh, we can differentiate with respect to x 
uh, with respect to x, say three times, and with respect to y, say four times. Okay, so then you so you can do partial differentiation. Okay, so, so don't worry if you don't do, you know, if you don't do um, further maths, further eight maths, don't worry. Uh, but you can do partial differentiation as well. So you can do normal differentiation and partial differentiation. Okay, so we do differentiation. We can take Taylor series expansions. So, for example, if you want to know what x e to the power x uh, multiplied by cos of x, um, right, and then we want dot series so there's a function called series uh so we, we're going to take an expansion around x is zero and we're going to take uh the first um 10 up to order 10. Yeah, so this is the so this is a tape you know this is a taylor series expansion or the mclaurin series expansion okay so we've got taylor or taylor or mclaurin series expansions and in this case you can see we go up to order big o uh, up to order x10. Now again, you, know, you can imagine trying to do this by hand, A level is quite hard. So you can try and do this by hand and then you can check your answers. Yeah, so we can we can use the series function to check our McLaurin and Taylor series expansions. Okay, so we can do series expansions, we can integrate. So we use a function called integrate. Uh, so, you know, wanna integrate a quadratic x squared Take away seven multiplied by x plus eight, and then we integrate with respect to x. So, so you know this is our indefinite integration. Indefinite integration. Okay, and you get the answer there. Now you'll all see that there should be a plus c on the end. You know, you know when you do indefinite integration, it should be a plus c. So all we have to do is we can just say print. Uh, we can copy and paste, you know, so we can promote command C or control C the integral. Yeah, so we can do that and then we can just plus C on the end. Okay. And again, notice that whatever we want to print has to be inside the double quotes. So we're going to print out whatever the integral is, but then we're going to add the constant of integration back in. So we're just going to print the integral and then plus C on the end. Okay, so you, now you can see we get the correct answer. Yeah, so it's x cubed over 3, take away 7x squared over 2 plus 8x plus c, because it's an indefinite integral. So we can just use print to put the c back in. Uh, we can also do definite integration. So suppose we wanted to integrate the same function, command v. Oh, sorry. So we can integrate again the x squared minus 7, 8. Uh, uh, yeah, and then... Instead of just integrating with respect to x, we're going to integrate uh, x goes from 1 to 2. You know, so we can put our limits. And again, remember, parentheses need to match up in correct pairs. Okay, so this is a definite integral. We want to integrate x squared, seven, take away 7x plus 8, where x goes from the limits 1 to 2. You know, so it's a definite integral. And, you, and it represents the area under the graph and between x is one or two. Okay, so you can see the area is minus one sixth. Um, so okay, yeah, I think uh, somebody was saying, I think Blanco was saying infinity. Okay, so we can sum. Okay, so there's a function called summation to do uh, sums. So we can sum one over x squared, where x goes from one to infinity. Now, infinity in symbolic Python is just little o, o. So, okay, so little o, o. Uh, so this is an infinite sum. Infinite sum. Yeah, so we want to work out what is one plus uh, a quarter plus a ninth plus a sixteenth plus one over 25, etc. All the way up to infinity. Yeah. And you'll see you get the answer pi squared over six. Pi squared over six, where does that come from? Okay, in order to understand where that comes from, uh, you have to do a degree in maths. Okay, so we do uh, Fourier series 
Uh, when you do Fourier series in the second year of maths degree, we explain to you where that astonishing result comes from. Uh, Patrick is asking, it's very interesting, but it gives the exact value for an integral. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So this, this is all symbolic computation. Okay, yeah, so the, the answer, if you sum one over x squared from one to infinity, you get the symbolic answer, pi squared over six. Okay, so it's an exact answer, it's not an approximation. Uh, we can also solve simultaneous equations. Uh, so the syntax is we, we have one equation in you know the first bracket, x plus five multiplied by y uh, minus two. Okay, somebody was asking, you know, um, if it was equal to two, you can just simply subtract two from both sides. Okay, so that's the same as x plus five y minus two equals zero. Okay, and then the second equation is minus three multiplied by x plus six multiplied by y uh, minus 15. Okay, so again, you know, we don't put the, e you don't have to put the equal zero. Uh, and then x and y, x and y. Okay, again, make sure parentheses match up in correct pairs. You now here we've got some round brackets, but we've also got some square brackets. So we're solving linear simultaneous equations. And you can see that these two straight lines cross when x is minus three and y is one. Um, yeah, okay, thank you, Patrick. Many great videos on YouTube for why the sum of one over n squared. Yeah, okay, thanks for that, Patrick. Okay, uh, next we come on to matrices. Okay, now I think you only do matrices in further maths A level, I think. Okay, but you know, it's worth while we're here, might as well look at matrices. Okay, so we've got the first row is one and minus one, and then the second row is two and comma three. Now, again, you have to make sure uh, parentheses match up in correct pairs. Okay, so don't worry if you've never done matrices before. You'll see, uh, so this is a matrix with two rows and two columns. The first row is one and minus one. And the second row is two, three. Okay, so this, this is called a matrix. Uh, so that's our matrix A. Well, let me just show you here. In Python, you can also assign multiple uh, values on a single line. Okay, so I'll, I'll just show you here. So we can say A is that matrix, and then B, let's see, we just do command C and command V. Uh, so B is the matrix zero. Zero and a two is the first row, and the second row is three, three. Okay, so you can all see here, I'm assigning A is the first matrix and B is the second matrix, but we can do all of that on one line. Okay, and you can, you can do this in some other programming languages as well. Yeah, so A comma B is equal to this first matrix comma the second matrix. So A is our first matrix, B is the second matrix. So we can assign multiple variables on a single line. Okay, so we've assigned A and B, and then we can do matrix, simple matrix algebra, two times the matrix A plus three times the matrix B gives us a new two by two matrix, and there's our matrix. Yeah, so to add, you know, to add two matrices together, we simply add the corresponding elements together. So you, you add the elements in row one, column one, to the element in row one, column one, to give the new element in row one, column one, etc. Uh, we can also do matrix multiplication. So A multiplied by the matrix B. Uh, so there, again, that gives us two by two matrix. Again, don't worry if you haven't done this before, um, you know, but they do it at further, uh, further maths A level. Yeah, so we, we can do matrix algebra. We can access uh, the first row of, of the matrix A. Okay, now here we are using something called zero-based indexing. Zero-based indexing. Okay, so with zero-based indexing, uh, zero is the first element, one would be the second element, etc. Okay, so we want a dot row zero. This would give us uh, row one of the matrix A. So we, if we uh, was A. Okay, so can you all see up here, matrix A, the first row is one minus one. 
Okay, so in the chat window, in the chat window, I want you to, how would you access, oh, I've, I've done the second row. Okay, so to access the second row, we've got a dot row one. Yeah, so that this gives us the second row of matrix A. Yeah, Blanca, you're, you're already ahead of me. Yeah, so I, I was going to ask, how would you access the first column of the matrix? Well, let, let's do the matrix. Let's just stick with A. How would you access the first column of the matrix A? Yeah. How would you access the first column of the matrix A? So put put your answers in the chat window. You see some of you some of you are racing ahead and you've already got the answer. So what do you think the what do you think the command is to access the first column of matrix A? Yeah, David, well done, David. Yeah, we want to access the first, and well done, Alexandra. We want to access the first column. Well done, Jay Beber. Okay, so most of you get the hang of this now. Yeah, so it's just a dot and in the symbolic Python, there is a function called col. Yeah, can you all see this? Elementary column selector. It's not column, it's just the, the function col. Okay, and to access the first column, uh, we use the index zero, okay, because we use zero-based indexing. So, so this is the first column of the matrix A. That's the first. So that this is how we access rows and columns of matrices. Okay, we can also work out the uh, transpose of a matrix. So uh, we use T. So this this gives us transpose, and the transpose we simply simply swap rows and columns, rows and columns. Okay, so when you work out the transpose of a matrix, row one becomes column one, row two becomes column two. Okay, so there is there is transpose of A. How do we know that's correct? Well, let's just take our A. Okay, so here is our matrix A, and here is the matrix A transpose. So you can see here, row one, you know, sorry, row one, row one of matrix A becomes column one, and row two of matrix A becomes column two. Okay. Uh, we've now got still 23 parts. Okay, so that's how we work out the transpose of a matrix. Uh, to work out the inverse of a matrix, you can take a to the power minus one. And so a to the power minus one gives us the inverse of the matrix. Okay, again, in the chat window, what would you think the function is called to find the inverse of the matrix A? So again, just try and figure out, yep, JP, Okay, so how would you find the inverse of matrix A using the function? Okay, JP Horton's had a good go of this. So again, just you know, try try and type in the console window. Yeah, Alexandra's got the right idea. Okay, now this one's a bit strange because you do a dot in and then you need a, an empty placeholder. Okay, because we're calling a function, so you need an empty placeholder. Uh, to, to for the inverse matrix. Okay, so and you can see it, it's the git, it's exactly the same as a to the power minus one. Now it's a bit misleading this because obviously with matrices, this does not mean one over the matrix. Yeah. The inverse of the matrix A does not mean one over the matrix. Okay, so it is a bit misleading. Okay, so it's better to use the inverse function. Okay, so this is the inverse function. How do we know this is the inverse of the matrix? Well, if we do A multiplied by its inverse, yeah, if we multiply the matrix A by its matrix inverse, we should get the identity matrix. And you'll see that we do get the identity matrix. So the two by two identity matrix is simply, you know, uh, you've got ones on the diagonal here. So A times its inverse gives the identity matrix. Uh, we can also find the um, the uh, determinant of a matrix. So there's a function called debt. Okay, this gives us the determinant. Uh, so there's the determinant of our matrix. Uh, we can we can you know create a matrix of zeros. 
Now you can imagine, you know, if you, if you were typing this in, it would take a long time to do a three by three matrix of zeros. So, so there is a function called zeros. Yeah, so there is a three by three matrix of zeros. Now you probably think, well, it wouldn't take that long to type in. So what about zeros, zeros, uh, 10 by 10? Okay, and obviously that matrix would take you a, a much longer time to type in. Yeah, that would take longer to type in. So zeros, 10, 10 gives us a 10 by 10 matrix of zeros. So you can see how this can greatly save time. You know, if you've got a matrix which has got a thousand rows and a thousand columns, you wouldn't want to have to type in all the zeros. So we just, you know, this is like giving us an empty matrix with all zeros. Uh, similarly, we have a function called ones. So we can have a, a matrix of ones, a one by five matrix of ones. And again, you know, that wouldn't take you long to type in, but you could do, you know, ones a hundred. Well, let's say ones, uh, you know, five by a hundred, uh, well, five by, Let's do five by twenty. Yeah, so we can we can create a matrix which is uh, five rows and twenty columns, all with ones in. Yeah, all of them with ones in. So there's a function called ones. Uh, you you can you can do an identity matrix. So for example, EYE, EYE gives us a square identity matrix. So suppose we wanted a you know twenty five I would give us an identity matrix, which is 25 rows by 25 columns, and there it is. Yeah, so EYE is a, another useful function for giving you an N by N identity matrix. And you can see how big this 25 by 25 identity matrix is. Um, I think somebody was asking about how do you get you know, numerical approximations? I can't remember who was saying this, but for example, suppose you want to work out pi to 500 decimal places. Okay, so uh, this calls the eval f function. Yeah, so it's equivalent to eval f. Uh, so capital N is like eval f. So we want to eval f, just means you know evaluate to a floating point. What is pi to 500 decimal places? And you can see uh, there is pi to 500 decimal places. Now, usually when I show this to you know younger children, they immediately start well, no, what's what's pi to five million decimal places? But you know, obviously it, it takes computer time. So don't try and crash the computer. You know, when, when I show this to young children, the first thing, the first thing they try to do is try and crash the computer. But you don't want to, you know, you don't want to break the computer then. Okay, but you know, you can work out uh, these things to a very large number of decimal places. How does one get a list of functions in SymPy? Uh, David, I think uh, th there is a, uh, can you see at the top here, David? There is, there is a URL. I don't think, because, because this is so big, David, it's best just to go to the, well, let me show you. Okay, so th this is the SymPy uh, webpage. Um, and then installation tutorials. Um, explanations, tutorials, how to utilize API referencing. Well, you can see, David, it, it's huge. You know, it, it's really, really big. So I don't think you would want to open this. Um, but you can see how big this is, David. So it's best just to go to the web pages. Okay, but you know, you can see it's huge. The symbolic Python library is huge and it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Okay, but I have I have put I have put the link. Yeah, so the link is at the top. Yeah, so you can access and, and it shows you what is available uh, within symbolic Python. Um right, now where are we with the schedule? Uh, symbolic Python. Okay, yeah, so we symbolic Python. And then after lunch we'll look at numerical Python. So yeah, you know, the time. okay, so that's what we're going to do next. Well, do, just to give you a heads up, after lunch, I'm going to show you uh, lists and arrays, which are more powerful than matrices. So in programming, 
lists are really, really powerful uh, objects. So I will, I will show you after after lunch. Uh, you know, we'll we'll look at lists uh, and arrays, etc., and even tensors. I'm I'm also going to introduce you to tensors uh, after the break. Okay, so we've got you know I finished a little bit early there. I don't know what was the schedule. Um, so we've done symbolic Python one fifteen till two o'clock. Okay, and then we'll, at two o'clock we're going to have a lunch break. So that gives us plenty of time now for you to ask me questions. Okay, so are there any questions about symbolic symbolic computation? Okay, we've got quite a few minutes now. So please, in the chat window, uh, you know, for out24, has a dot t overwritten a? Oh, uh, let me see what out24 is. Out24. Um, uh, so out24 out is like a new thing now, uh, but it, it's equivalent to a. So, you know, if you look at out24, you'll see it's the same as a. Does that, uh, that answer your question, Alexandra? But, but Python still knows what A is. Yeah, it still knows that A is one minus one, two, and three. But now also, out 24 is the same matrix. Yeah, they, they are equal. Does that answer your question, Alexandra? Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Anybody else got any questions about symbolic computation? And, you know, if you want more information on symbolic computation, it's best to look at the web pages. Or you, or you can get my book. Um, yeah. When you import SymPy, does math get imported as well? No, Martin. Uh, SymPy is a different library to math. Okay, they are different libraries. So math, math is only a small library. SymPy is a huge library. Yeah. So, but I think everything everything you need in in math is already in, is also included in SymPy. Okay, so I, I think all of the functions in math are included in SymPy. Yeah, but, but they are different, they are different libraries. But, but math is probably a subset of SymPy. So you wouldn't need to import both. No, Martin, you would only need to import SymPy. SymPy covers all of the functions in, in math. I think I think it does. Um uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've just recently come across um yeah, does, does anybody anybody interested in cryptography? Does anybody Anybody work for GCHQ? I guess importing several libraries. Yeah, yeah, AJD. Yeah, it's not good to import lots and lots of libraries into one. Yeah, because you might have functions which are common to both. A good example of that is the POW function. Okay, so POW, the default POW, you have three variables, but within SymPy, and I think within math, POW only takes two variables. Okay, so in your own time, so let me just say, check out the POW function. Okay, so there is a, there is a function called POW. Uh, in the math library, it has two arguments, but uh, within, within Python, it, it has, you know, with, without the libraries, it has three, it has three variables. A bit of bad design in there. Yeah, David, it, it, it did cause me some problem uh, problems when I was because uh, I, I introduced cryptography to our foundation computing students. Did you say SymPy essentially is sub superset of math? No, math math is a subset of SymPy. Yeah, I know it doesn't seem to be in SymPy. But just, oh right, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So, so I take that back. Yeah, AJD. Okay, so it's not in in. Yeah, let me see E. E is not defined yet. Yeah. Okay, so so there are there are some things in math which aren't in SymPy. I'm surprised about that though. I'm surprised that E isn't in SymPy. Not that is surprising. Okay, yeah. So so they are they are two different libraries. Okay. Uh, any other any other questions? Anybody else got any questions about symbolic? Uh, computation. Uh, just just uh, another one I, I like to do. So typically for writing programs, 
Uh, Blanca, so typically for writing programs, I think you have you load all the libraries. Uh, no, you, you should only use, you should only load the libraries you need. There are lots and lots of libraries. Believe me, there are lots of libraries. You only need, you only need load the ones you need. Where we get a good range of physical constants. Uh, AJD, yeah, I think they're all within NumPy. All the physical constants, I'm pretty sure, are in NumPy. Yeah. The declaration doesn't, something different from matrix, right? Yeah, Patrick. The, the, the C you put in there is a list of lists, which is not a matrix. And we are doing list of lists after dinner. Yeah, so after lunch, I will show you uh, lists of lists. And it gets really interesting. Yeah, X1 gives you a, yeah. Yeah, what is the more powerful, Maxima versus Simpy? Hate Maxima. David, uh, I don't think I've ever used Maxima. I'm not, I don't, has anybody else used Maxima? Uh, I would think Maple. I would think Maple and Mathematica are more. Well, I'm not sure. Um, so you, you have to you have to pay for Maple and you have to pay for Mathematica. So I, I would guess that at the moment Mathematica and Maple are more powerful than SymPy. But you know that there are thousands of developers with Python. Um, you know, so it, it's always catching up. I would guess. I would guess that. SimPy, SimPy is catching up with Mathematica and Maple. Okay, I think SimPy, I think you'll find SimPy is catching up with Mathematica and Maple. I've used Maxima as part of OU curriculum. I think they are pretty similar until now. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about Maxima, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing because you have to pay a lot of money for Mathematica and Maple, I would think that the symbolic computation in Mathematica and Maple uh, is probably more powerful than SymPy, but, but, but I can't say for sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, any, any other questions about symbolic Python? No? Okay, it's, it's 10 to. Okay, so it means it just means we can have a, a, a nice break now for, um, well, I'll, I'll show you my book. Um, so we will we will take a lunch break at two o'clock. Oh, oh, David is David. That, that's interesting because I used to work at the OU. The OU uh, uh, um, used Maple not long ago. Do they now use Maxima? Okay, so I, I used to work for the OU. Um, yeah, they do use Maxima for MST one two four. Yeah, I, I wonder why they're not using Python. They, yeah, when you when you go back to it, you should tell you should tell them they should be using Python. One one two five. Not sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, there we go. Uh, POW works with numbers but not letters. Symbolic right. Um, right. Um, yeah, I think POW only works with numbers, I'm sure. They don't they don't on basic maths. Okay. They use Maxima. Python looks way better and it's part of computing modules. Yeah, the, the re the reason I'm I'm asking you all to use Python. Is because as you know, as you saw, Python is the most popular programming language in the world. When you go for job interviews, I don't think anybody's ever going to say to you, "Do you know Maxima?" Yes, you know th this is why I'm, I'm encouraging everyone to learn Python. Because when you go for a job interview, well, I, I don't think it's very likely that you know I, I, somebody in data science or artificial intelligence is going to say to you, "Can you program in Maxima?" Whereas all of them will say, can you program it in Python? Oh, use Minitab. Oh, yeah. If, if they should be using R instead of Minitab. I just don't know. POW works with numbers, but not letters, symbols, right? Uh, Blanca, yep, again, yep. So you use PO, POW a lot in cryptography. Uh, you, may, you may have heard, so uh, POW is used with the RSA algorithm. 
Okay, so um, yeah, so you use POW to work out uh, powers, but it, you can also use it with the RSA. I'll, if you look up, look it up on the internet, you'll you'll find examples. Mini tabs for stats, yes, yes, uh, Jay Bever, uh, but you can you can use you can use Python and R for stats. Yeah, so so mo most people around the world now are using Python and R for statistics. Yeah, and uh, is Minitab free? I don't know if Minitab is free. Is Minitab freely available? Because Python and R are both free. Minitab is very expensive. So David, you know, why pay for Minitab if everything you can do with Minitab you can also do in R or in Python? Okay, and I'm not sure whether Minitab is really very powerful, a lot more powerful than R and Python. Okay, um, right, just got five minutes. I might as well just plug my book again while, while we're here. I'll just show you what's available. Okay, so I have written this book. Um, CR, it's published by CRS. Level. It covers lots of science subjects, math, uh, physics, stats, biology, chemistry, etc. You can download all of the programs for free. Okay, let me put this link in the. Let's see. I'll put it in uh, my Python files and notebooks. Okay, so I've just put the link for you in the chat window. So for my book, you can download all of the all of the Jupyter notebooks and all of the Python files and all of the I, Python idle files for free. Okay, so these are all freely available. And then just let me show you. Um, okay, and then the solutions, solutions to exercises in the book. Freely available. Okay, so uh, there are exercises in the book. Okay, let me just show you this. So for example, you know, if you look in chapter one, uh, you know, I've, I've got all of the solutions are available and you can even download the Jupyter notebook. Uh, how much is the book? I think it's about 50 pounds on, on Amazon, etc. Okay, it's about 50 pounds. I know it's quite expensive, but it covers a lot, an awful lot of material. Okay, so these are the solutions for, you know, oh, that's, yeah. so, you know, these are solutions to exercises. Uh, and again, all of these solutions are completely free. You can see there's a hell of a lot of Python programs uh, in this. Uh, and there, there are, you know, there's Jupyter notebooks and Google Colab notebooks. Uh, so here's, here's another... Uh, animation for you and, and again I'm, I'm going to show you you know I will show you more animations uh, later on so we do animations uh, is the Python for the AS level maths and Python for A level maths is all covered in the book but then if you look at section two okay so section two uh, this is where we cover other the scientific object you know, scientific subjects so biology, you know, so this is a, a blood cell population model. Uh, we've got, um, a, a, this is a predator-prey model. So we're, we're doing phase portraits with predator-prey. Uh, compartmental model of COVID. Okay, so this is a compartmental, compartmental model of the spread of COVID in Manchester. So you've got, uh, what is it? Uh, 2,700,000 people living in Manchester and one person gets COVID. So this, so this is you know the spread of COVID in Manchester. Uh, then we've got uh, single fibre muscles. So this is um, stretching and holding and contracting muscle. We've got chemistry. You know how do you balance chemical uh, equations? Uh, we've got catalytic reactions. Um, that's chemistry. Then we've got data science. So I'll show you all about pandas for data science. Uh, 
Some of you, I think if you do a further maths A level, you do the simplex method. So within data science, I show you, you know, how you can use Python for the simplex method. Uh, we do um, clustering. Uh, we do economics, uh, the Cobb-Douglas model of production, solo swan model of economic growth. Um, you may have, you may, some of you may have heard of modern portfolio theory, you know, investments, uh, black skulls equation, uh, engineering, we do ele linear electrical circuits. Uh, we do, um, well, this, this is a three mass four spring system. I even do the double pendulum. So here's a double pendulum. I give you the Python programs for that. Uh, then we do fractals and multi fractals, uh, image processing. So nice examples where we do vascular architecture of the eye, um, a brain tumor, you know, so you can use image processing to work out uh, what, what proportion of a brain you know, has a brain tumor. Um, then you've got numerical methods for ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations. Um, you know, oil, Euler's method, Runge cutter methods. I even do partial differential equations. So I do advection and here is heat diffusion in the plate. I'll show you how to do that in Python. Uh, we cover physics. Um, so we do uh, nonlinear optics, uh, Josephson junctions and hysteresis. And we do the three body problem from astronomy, you know, astrophysics. So this is, you know, uh, two heavy bodies with a lighter body. Uh, statistics, we do linear regression. So if any of you do statistics, you can do linear regression in Python. Uh, we can do uh, the ANOVA tests. Uh, we do uh, we can do Monte Carlo simulation, etc. Uh, and then the final the final section of the book covers uh, neural networks and artificial intelligence. So we show you um, here's the neural networks. You know, so you do a neural network of an XOR logic gate. Uh, I do back propagation um, and. Uh, and we do tense introduction to TensorFlow and Keras. Uh, so these are your activation functions. Um, and we do recurrent neural networks. And wait until you see this result. Uh, so we can do uh, chaos. I'm sure you've all heard of chaos. So this is called the Lorenz attractor. This is the X output of the Lorenz attractor, and it's called chaos. And we can use long short term memory, artificial intelligence. Uh, so the the true, you know, the true output of this chaotic time series is blue, and the prediction, the AI prediction, is red. Look how good that is. So this is using artificial intelligence. It's called long short term memory to predict chaos. Yeah. So the red is the prediction, and the blue is what actually happened. Okay. So we can use this to predict chaos. And you're probably wondering, can you use artificial intelligence to predict the stock markets? Yes. Okay, so this is this is uh, Google stock prices, you know. So the green is the historical uh, stock value for Google. Uh, the blue is what actually happens in the future, and the red is the prediction. Can you believe this? Yeah, so this is the red predicting, you know, the the Google stock prices. Okay, and then we can use convolutional neural networks. Uh, that that finishes it. Okay, I don't don't worry if you don't understand all of that, but you know, if you if you want an introduction, a, a gentle introduction to Python, uh, covering and then chapters on AS level maths, chapters on A level maths, and then examples in biology, chemistry, data science, economics, engineering, physics, stats, and then a gentle introduction to neural networks and artificial intelligence, then this is the book for you. Yeah. So, so that's the book. Okay. So that's enough of me plugging the book. Um, so we're going to break now for lunch. And after lunch, I'm going to introduce you to uh, numerical Python. So that's lists, arrays, and tensors. Uh, and then and I'll also show you how to do nice, uh, you know, plot nice figures in Python. Uh, and then and then the final session, I'm going to introduce you to programming. So I'm going to show you how to write simple programming, uh, simple programs in Python. So this is in the first of these books at the bottom right. Yeah, yeah, Alexandra. Yeah, so I've written two books. 
This is the first one. The other book is at a very advanced level. So this is for final year undergraduates and postgraduates. Yeah, so dynamical systems with applications using Python is for final year students and for postgraduate students. But the first one is for A-level pupils, A-level teachers and undergraduates. Yeah, so that, that's just a, an introduction to Python. Do you have an example of Bayesian network analysis on Python? I don't, Taru, but if you look on the internet, there will be lots of examples on the internet. Okay, thanks for asking all those questions. Uh, so again, we'll now break. Okay, so we're gonna break and we will return at, what time we return? Uh, we will return at, okay, we're coming back at 2.30. Yeah, so we'll be back at 2.30. We'll have a 30 minute break. So we'll return at 2.30, let me put it here. Uh, so I'll see you all again at 2.30. 30 p.m. And let me do a little, uh, uh, can we do a little wave? Where's a little wave? Okay, is that a goodbye wave? Okay. I'm trying to do a goodbye wave, but I'm um, going to find a goodbye wave. A clap, no. no goodbye wave. Okay, so I'll see you all again at 2.30. Okay, so again, I will stop sharing and I switch off, you know, switch off the camera and the mic, but we will be back at 2.30 and I'll introduce you to uh, lists, you know, which are very important in any programming language and you'll see why later. Okay, so I'll see you all again at 2.30.
Well, welcome back, everyone. We've got two minutes before we start again. So, any quick questions before we start? The chat window, any quick questions? Will you touch in file handling? Uh, we will be dealing with, yeah, we will be creating files and reading files on file handling. Uh, AJD, uh, if you ask me at the end of the workshop, I can show you examples of where you can, you know, load data into files, etc., cetera, and, and write to files, etc. Here, just a few more seconds and we'll make a start on our tutorial three. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, so this is a tutorial introduction to numerical Python, also known as NumPy. And I'm going to show you about lists, arrays, and I'll also introduce you to tensors as well. Okay, so everyone around the world always imports NumPy using the alias NP. Okay, you probably you probably you know thinking why don't we just from NumPy import star? Well, the reason is that this is the way everyone uh, imports NumPy. So they use the alias NP, uh, you know, for the nums for the namespace NumPy, because uh, quite quite often we do import symbolic Python and NumPy at the same time. Okay, and there might be some functions in common. So so instead we use NP, you know, as 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 the namespace. So the first type of object we're going to look at is called a list. So A is going to be our first list. And in this case, it just consists of numbers minus one, uh, nine, 10, four, uh, three, seven, eight, zero, and nine. Okay, so this, a list consists, you know, can consist of numbers or letters or strings or really anything. Okay, uh, and there are there are also like tuples and sets and, and of other objects, but mainly in programming, the list is the most versatile object in, in all programming. Uh, I've just had a quick meeting. Okay, yeah, thanks, Sharon. Okay, so this this is our first list, should, and you can see it's just a list of uh, integers. To access the elements of a list, I say we use zero-based indexing and we use square brackets. So again, remember we are using zero-based indexing. Uh, if any of you use MATLAB, MATLAB is not the same. To, you know, to access elements in lists in MATLAB and vectors, etc., um, it's one-based index. You know, so the first element is one. So th this would be A1 in, in MATLAB. But, but in Python, we use zero-based indexing. So A0 is the first element in the list. Can you all see that? The first element is minus one. Uh, similarly, the second element in the list is, is accessed with A1. So we use the index one to get the second element in the list. And you can see you know, the second element in this list is nine. Uh, if you want to read from right to left, then the last element is just a minus one. So that this gives us the last element. So this is the last element, the last element in the list. 
Yes, this is the last element in the list. So how do you think you access the second to last element in the list? Again, put your answers in the chat window. What do you think the command is to access the second to last element in the list? Uh, Patrick, we are very used to one to do one thing Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So to access the second to last element, yep. Yeah. Well done, AJD. Well done, Jay Baba. Yeah, I think you're all getting the angle this quite quickly. So this the second to last element in the list, we use minus two. Okay, so you can see zero is the second to last element in the list. Uh, now we can slice. So here we're going to slice the list A. Um, we're going to slice from A1. And remember, A1 is the second element in the list. And we go up to, but well, not including A5. I'm going to go up in steps of two. OK, so we read this as start with A1. We go up to, but not including A5. And we go up in steps of two. Okay, so let's let's have a look at this then. So A1 would give us nine. Uh, A5 would be one, two, three, four, five. A5 would be seven, but we do not include the A5. We go up to, but not including A5. So we start with the nine, we go up in steps of two, so we go to four, and then we do not go up to A5, we don't go up to seven. So we just get the elements nine and four. And that's, so this is called slicing. Uh, the next one, A, we're going to start with A2. Okay, so think about it. A2 would be the third element, so it would be this 10. We're going to go up to A8, but not including A8. So A8 would be A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, A7, A8. So that's the last element. So we do not include that. And in this one, we go up in steps of three. Okay, so you can see we start with A, A2. And we've opened steps of three, one, two, three, eight, seven, but then we do not include the last one. Okay, so as I say, this is called slicing. We can also slice lists from the end and the beginning. So for example, A colon three. Okay, A colon three gives us, so it means start at the beginning of the list, go up to, but not including A3. Yeah, so we start with A naught, A1, A2 up to but not including A3. So it just gives us the first three elements in the list. Yeah, and it's a new list. So again, in the in the chat window, how do you think you would access a list which is the, the final four elements? So how would we get a new list which is just the, the final four elements of A? What, what do you think the command is? Again, put your answers in the chat, you know, in the chat window. So suppose we only want the, you know, that we only want this seven eight zero oh, nine from from A. So what do you think the command is? So this is called slicing. What do you think the command is to get the final four elements in the list? Okay, J Bevo is what A minus four colon. And we just want the last four elements. Yes, ditto. Okay. Now, obviously, you can, you can try this, you know, try it to see what you get. Okay, let, let's try. Uh, Jay Beber has said, what about minus four? Because that's the, you know, the fourth um, from the end. And then we want everything after that. And you can see it works. Yes, so well done, you two. Yep, AJD and Jay Beber. Well, that works fine. Yeah, so remember minus four, we read the fourth element from the right, and then we just want all of the elements afterwards. So this colon means all the elements in the list afterwards. So we can we can have you know we can get the first elements in the list or the final elements in the list using so all of this is called slicing. Now again, some of you will understand this straight away, uh, some of you won't. So this is where you just got to practice, you know, make up your own lists. Uh, and just keep practicing until you understand how slicing works. Oh, yeah, it is very, very useful. Uh, Jay Bevel, let's see what that gives us. Uh, what is it? A colon colon minus one. Uh, so what is that? Oh, so that just revert. Oh, okay, but I can't even figure out what that does. 
No, no, wait. Reverses it. Oh, yeah. Okay, just reverses the list. Yep. Okay. Okay, so that reverses the list. Thank you. And, and you know, there, there are lots of work, there are lots of different things you can do with lists. Okay. Now, I know those of you who do MATLAB probably think, well, these just look like vectors. Okay, but we have to be very careful here because these are not vectors. And to demonstrate that, if you do two multiply by the list A, yeah, so we multiply the list two, uh, the list A by the number two, you'll see this is something very different to a vector. Okay, this is not a vector. So if you multiply a list by a number, you just create a new list, or it's, you know, well, in this case, it's just the, the first list, but then repeated. Yeah, so, so it's two versions of the list in one list. Yeah, so this is not vector, you know, it's not scalar multiplication. So lists are different to vectors. We can add elements using a function called append. Okay, so onto the list, onto the list A, we are going to append the um, real number, well, natural number 10. Okay, so now if we just list A, you'll see that we've now added 10 onto the end of the list. So A is now a list with 10 added onto the end of the list. So that's how you add. Now, obviously, you know, if you think about doing iteration, then you can use the append function a lot because you, know, you get a list and you just keep on, when you iterate, you just add another element onto the list. So this is append is, is useful when you do iteration. Uh, and we can also, if you wanted to, you can remove elements from a list. But in this case, when you use remove, it removes the first nine reading from left to right. Okay, because you'll notice here, there are two nines. You can all see there are two nines in the list. So when you remove the, the nine, it removes the first nine reading from the left. Yeah, so it removes the first nine reading from the left. Okay, so that's append and remove. Uh, then we've got list. Okay, if we want to create a, a list of, you know, a long list of numbers, we can use a function called range. Okay, and this lists, uh, lists uh, natural numbers from zero up to, but not including five. Okay. Uh, Simon says, is there an opposite function to append from the end? There will be a way to do it, Simon. Um, mine has removed the nine by the 10. Uh, both, both nines are near the 10. Sorry, no, okay. Uh, there, there will be, yeah, there will, as, as I say, there are lots and lots of different ways to work, you know, again, I could spend hours and hours just talking to you about lists. And, and I don't know everything about lists, so you can try, you know, you, you just play around with these until you figure out uh, how to do things. Okay, so list range five lists the natural numbers. So remember, we, we have zero based indexing. So we will start, start with zero. We go up to, but not including five. Uh, the next one, we're going to list, and then we have range. So we're going to go from two, up to, but not including 10, and it steps off two. Yeah, so we go from two, uh, up to, but not including 10 in steps of two. So that's the way to, to read that. Uh, another one, we can, we can go down, you know, we can, we can decrease the numbers. So we can say, start at 10, go down to, but not including five, and we can see, keep on subtracting two. Yeah, so we start at 10, we go down to, but not including five, and go down in steps of two. So that gives that. Now, well, obviously you could just type these in, but you can imagine, you know, if you if you want a range of numbers that's really long with tens of thousands of numbers in it, then this range function comes in really handy. We can also have lists of lists. I know somebody earlier was saying, you know, is this a matrix? So we've got a list one, two, three, and then another list four, five, oh, four, uh, five, four, five, five, and six. And remember, parentheses need to match up in correct pairs. Okay, so AA is a list of lists. It is not a matrix. Okay, 
So I'm sorry with this. Now you have to get used to lists, arrays, uh, matrices, vectors, tensors. So array is one of the creating. But yeah, yeah, Blanca. We use we use arrays to create vectors and uh, uh, matrices and tensors, etc. Okay, so to access elements in lists of lists, uh, well, so for example, if we just type AA0, then what we're asking is, is for is the first element in the list AA. Yeah, the first element in the list AA. And because this is a list of lists, the first element in the list is itself a list. Yeah, so the first element in the list AA is the list one, two, three. We can also access elements in the list so we want, uh, you know, the second element in the second list. Yeah. So AA, remember, we're using zero-based indexing. So this is the um, second element in the second list. Okay, now again, in the chat window, how do you think, so how do you access the second element? How do you access the second element in the first list? Okay, so in the in the chat window, you know what what do you think the command is to access the second element in the first list? So you can see the second element in the first list is two. So how would you access that? The second element in the first list. Jay Bevers had to go. Oops, you see some of you are putting the numbers the wrong way around. Alexandra's had to go. Yes, yeah, so we want the um what was it the, the second element in the first list second element in the first list maybe let, let's just try that we want the second element in the first list so we first want to access the first list and then the second element in that list Okay, so we need AA, this, the first zero says, okay, get the first list. And then the second one gets the second element in the first list. Yep. So the first, the first, first number accesses the list, and the second one accesses the element in the list. Okay, so hopefully everyone's understood that. Now you can imagine this gets really, really complex because here we're just looking at a list of lists. But imagine in data science, we have lists of lists of lists of lists of lists and the list goes on yeah now accessing elements within lists of lists of lists of lists you can imagine how complex it gets um right so that's that one uh we can we can find that the size of one of our lists so you can see aa is only of length two because it's only got two elements in the list aa even though the elements are lists themselves yeah, so so AA only has two elements in its list. Okay, uh, what else can we do with lists? I think that's enough for now. Okay. Um, yeah, we've done slice. We did, did we do slicing? Yeah, we did slicing of lists. That's okay. Okay, so now we are going to move on to uh, arrays. Yeah, we're going to move on to arrays. And remember, arrays are not the same as lists. Okay, so here is our first array. So we're going to call it capital A. A is equal to, now notice from NumPy, we are calling a function called arrange. And, and notice it's only got one R. Yeah, it's only got one R. Uh, An arrange is uh, evenly spaced values within a given interval. Okay, so A range five will give us an array of numbers, starting, remember, with the index zero, and up to, but not including five. Okay, so what, let's see what this gives us. Okay, so we, if we have a look what A is, then now you can see it is an array. And if we print A, then you'll see, now, initially you might think, well, this is just another list. Okay, but there's an important difference. Yeah, there's a difference here. And the difference is lists contain commas. Arrays do not contain commas. Okay, so you can see there are just blanks between the elements in an array. 
Okay, so I'll just say that again for clarity. Lists, the elements in lists are separated by commas. The elements in arrays are separated by gaps. Okay, so you can see lists are not the same as arrays. Okay, we can convert uh, an array to a list okay, using a function called toList. Okay. Oh, not it, not it there. Oh, that's the... Oh, I've done that. Um, right, I don't know what that is. Right, let's just say what A is now. Uh, A, oh, you'd have to, I think you'd have to say, um, yeah, might just show commas when you print A. Okay, uh, Patrick, if it's got array in front of it, then that is an array. Okay, but if, if you print it, it doesn't put the commas in. Okay, so, um, Okay, so that, that did work anyway. So uh, A to list, convert an array to a list. Uh, then I, oh, I didn't assign anything to it. Um, uh, let's call it AL equals A dot to list. Oh, error exception to to list. Okay, I don't know, it's given errors, but I don't know why. But you can see here, AL is now a list. Okay, remember, lists have commas. Arrays do not have commas. Yeah. I see, asking for A is not the same as print A. No, yeah, print A and just A are, are different. To keep the original array, could we do B equals A to list? Um, the, the, the function to list, Converts an array to a list. Yeah. So uh, I think there is a way. I think there is a way to do it the other way around. But um, you know, you can just easily create arrays anyway. But there, there may be a way to, to convert a list into an array. Uh, but I think you just. I think you would just do np dot array around the list anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, yeah. okay. So that's how you convert an array to a list. Uh, we can also have um, you know, uh, well, we're, we're going to create now a two by three array. So np dot array. Uh, sorry, np dot a range uh, six. Okay, so that that would give us the number zero to five. But then we're going to reshape that array into a two by three array. Okay, so if we look at b. Then you can see it is a two by three array. Or if we print it, print B, you can see it looks like a list. You know, it looks you, you might think oh, it looks just like a list of lists. But remember, there are no there are no commas between the elements, so that means that this is an array. So that's how uh, a range. Yeah, a range is just a range. No, so you might you might want to work with the numbers say zero to a million. So a range will take you from zero. If you do a range a million and one, that would give you numbers from zero to a million. Yeah, so it's just a shorthand way to write all of the uh, integers down. Uh, right, the next one, a range, uh, A to list, B. Right, now vectors, how do we deal with vectors? So we use arrays. So we say u equals np dot array. Uh, and our vector is going to be one, two, and three. Okay, so this is a three-dimensional vector. Okay, so this is a 3D vector. Now, I think, I'm not sure if you do three-dimensional vectors in A-level maths or further A-level maths. Uh, well, this, this is a three-dimensional. Obviously, you can also have a two-dimensional vector, but this is a three-dimensional vector. Uh, and it's also a rank one tensor. And I'm going to explain about tensors in a minute. So this is a rank one tensor. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, U. If we print U. Okay, so U, I know it looks like a list, but remember it's not a list because it hasn't got commas. 
Uh, how does it ha act like a vector? Well, if we multiply, if we multiply u by a scalar, two multiplied by u gives us, you know, the, the vector two u. So we, you know, the elements are then two, four, six. So this then you can see, um, you know, acts like a vector. And this is how this is how we work with vectors in Python. Yeah. Have you got up to UP? David, David, have I have got U equals A. Oh, array. Remember, array has got two R's in it, David. Yeah. Why did you use np.array when numpy lib has been imported? Uh, so we use, oh yeah, array. So numpy is kind of the, you know, the alias we use for numpy. Yeah, so instead of having to type numpy.array, we just do np. So we did that right at the beginning of the tutorial. Yeah. David says, uh, I have lots of dashes. I have lots of dashes. Oh, so no, we haven't imported all functions. Yeah, JP Hall, yeah, we, we haven't imported, you know, so we've only, we've only imported numpy as the A is NP. We haven't imported all the functions, so that's why we have to keep on typing NP array or NP A range, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Right, so that's uh, vectors. That's how we deal with vectors. Now, uh, again, uh, you might think, well, how do you deal with uh, matrices? Well, so C is equal to NP dot array. Uh, so I make it one, one, and then uh, zero, one. Okay, so there is our array C. And then remember we, we did this with matrices. I'm now gonna you know put it all on one line. C is gonna be that array, and D will be equal to uh, command C, command V, and D will be a different array, which is five, four, five, and four, and three and four. Three and four. Okay, so these these are two by two arrays. Let me just say two by two arrays. Okay, now dealing with arrays. Oh, I made a mistake. So I'll just use the up arrow key to go back. Uh, I've missed out an opening square bracket on the first array. I've missed out the opening bracket on the second array. Okay, so remember again, parentheses need to match up in correct pairs. Yeah, so if I, if I just show you C and D, yeah, so there's those are two arrays, or I can print C and D. Yeah, so here are here are my two arrays, and they are two by two arrays. Now you might think, well, they just look like matrices, uh, but then they're, they're not. They're more powerful than matrices. So for example, we can do C times D. Now this is what we call Element wise, elem, element wise multiplication, multiplication. Okay, so that's what we get if C times D. So we just multiply the elements in row one, column one, by the elements in row one, column one, etc. We can also do multi matrix multiplication using the dot function. So C dotted with D. Oh, Oh, why do I keep getting messages? Okay, so that, that gives us, you'll see that gives you the matrix multiplication. Uh, or you can do np dot dot uh, c with d. So you can see there are a number of ways to do this. But this, you know, this is not the same as c times d. Can you all see that this is different? So it, this one is matrix multiplication. Don't worry if you haven't done matrix, matrix multiplication. You can easily find out how to do it on the web. Okay, so this is matrix multiplication. This one is element-wise multiplication. So arrays are more powerful than matrices because you can, you can define lots of different ways to multiply matrices together, which is very useful in artificial intelligence. Okay, so we use arrays a lot in artificial intelligence. In fact, we use something called a tensor. 
uh, any standard operational function of this element y is right. Standard operation uh, function action is element y is right. Element y is like the x c. Yeah, I think I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah, blank. Yeah. Um, okay, that's so that there's a, there are different ways to multiply arrays together. Uh, let's have a look at another one. We've got uh, e equals np dot array. Uh, so now we're going to look at a uh, three by three array. Right, I, I won't put gaps in because you know, just to save on space. Uh, zero, one, two, and three, four, five. Oh, this down to work back. Okay, so in this case, if we print out E, you'll see that this is a three by three array. Now, um, so it's a three by three array, but the uh, dimension of this, uh, let's see, E dot end dim. Okay, this function end dim gives us something called the tensor rank. Okay, so the tensor rank of this three by three uh, array is two. Okay, so it's it, because you've got a three by three array. Okay, now uh, we had what well, was on vector u. Okay, if you do u, remember u was just a, a three-dimensional vector. Okay, the, the tensor rank of that one is one. Okay, even though it's a three-dimensional vector, but it's a rank one tensor. A three by this three by three array is a rank two tensor. Okay, now let's see if you can get your heads around this. Uh, can you define a Simple rank three tensor. Right. Now I know some of you all understand. It's all right. Well, just you'll you'll understand more when when I give you the answer. Okay. So I've given you a rank one tensor. Let me just show you you again. Print u. Okay. So here's u. It's a three dimensional vector, but it's a one rank one tensor. E is a three by three array, but that's a rank two tensor. So what do you think a rank three tensor would look like? Okay, so call, call it capital T. Okay, so put your answers in the chat window. What do you think a rank three tensor might look like? Yeah, right, here's a rank one tensor, you. Yeah, this is just a rank one tensor. This is a rank two tensor. So what would a rank three tensor look like? I'll give you a clue. Like right, David's put one, two, three, four, right? So think of a two by two by two array. Okay, Dave, David, you're not right with that one. That that one, two, three, four, that is still a rank one tensor. Okay, that is still a rank one tensor. To get a rank three tensor, how would you construct a two by two by two array? Okay, so what, what would T look like? You need a two, two lots of two by two arrays. So what would that look like? Two lots of two by two arrays. Well, let's see if anyone can get it. Okay, I've shown you what a rank one tensor looks like. I've shown you what a rank two tensor looks like. What does a rank three tensor look like? Anybody, anybody got any ideas? What would a rank three tensor look like? Okay, and, and the reason tensors are so important is uh, some of you may have heard of TensorFlow, which is you know um, a package for doing artificial intelligence. Well, TensorFlow works with tensors. Well, that's an interesting one, Jay Bether. Let's, let's see what we get with that one. Command C. And then let's see. That's right. What did you say? J dot ND is three. Yeah. Okay. Well done. But yeah, it's kind of a. Uh, um, like three times then. Um, yeah. 
Uh, it's kind of a, um, that's kind of, uh, what would you call it? Um, oh, yeah, right. NB, I think NB has got it. Uh, right, NB has nearly got it, right? Okay, the easiest one, let me just show you, is T is equal to NP dot array. Okay, and then we want two lots of two by two arrays. So you need three opening brackets. Now we could do like one, two, and three, four. There's our, there's our first two by two array. And then we need another two by two array. Five, six, seven, eight. And then we need to close three square brackets. Okay, and remember again, you've got to have parentheses matching up in correct pairs. Yeah. So if we now print T, hopefully you can see it's two lots of two by two arrays. So the uh, rank, the tensor rank of T is three. You all see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, G, I think G, yeah, I think that one would work as well. But hopefully, you know, if you look at this T, and you can see it's clearly two sets of two by two arrays, then you know that, that's how it kind of works. So it's you can think of, you know, if you had a rank four tensor, you could think of two lots of two lots of two by two arrays. Again, this is one of those where you, you just play around with your own examples. You know, play play around with your own examples until you understand what the tensor rank is. Okay, uh, we put E in. Let's just remind ourselves what E is. So here's E is our array. We can now do vectorized computation. Okay, so we can do sum, and we'll take axis is zero. Okay, so this is called vectorized computation. I'll explain what that is in a second. Okay, so we're gonna sum using the axis is zero. Oh. Why is it giving me errors? All right, it's given it's given the right answer. I don't know why it keeps coming up with all of this. Right, yeah, but ignore all that. I don't know why it keeps coming up with that. Okay, so what this does is I'll I'll have to show you what A is again. So if we print down to A. Okay, so A is our A, and axis is zero means we're work, working with columns. Okay, axis is one, axis is one when it's work with rows, axis is zero is when we're with columns. So we just add the elements in the columns. Yeah, so one plus zero plus three is four, zero plus one plus four is five, and zero plus two plus five is seven. Now you'll notice with this, you know, we just call a function sum, we haven't had to use any loops. And, and after the next break, I'm gonna show you how to program with loops. So we don't like need any for loops or while loops. We just call a you know, simple function. So this is what we call vectorized computation, and this saves massively on memory. Okay, you can imagine, you know, in data science, you might have a, a, a an array which is like a thousand rows by a thousand columns. And if you want to work, you know, if you want to add sums, if you want to sum the rows or the columns, if you use for loops or while loops, that takes a lot of computer memory. So instead, we use vectorized computation. And it saves massively on memory. Uh, we could do do things like you know, find the minimum of uh, the elements in a row. So if we take axis oh, equals one. Oh, why is it giving this again? Really don't understand that. Okay, so here you know here's the minimum of each row. So again, I just you know, let's print the yeah. So the, the, the minimum of row one is zero. The minimum of row two is zero, and the minimum of row three is three. So again, this is vectorized computation because we haven't had to, you know, go through every element in the rows and every element in the column. So we're saving on uh, memory. We can do e dot cumulative sum. So I want to say, yeah. well, my appointments have been cancelled. Okay. Now we can do cumulative sum. And again, axis is zero, means we work with uh, columns. Ah, why is it doing that? Is everybody else getting these error messages? I don't know what's wrong with Python today. Okay, but you, you can see it does work. 
Yeah, so you can do the cumulative sum of the columns. Uh, yeah, no one good. So some some people are getting those errors. Just, eh, that's very strange. I might not have the latest version of Spider. Okay, or it's not not in the list. It's usually in the console. It's not in my memory. Yeah. Um. Right. Yeah. I think we might have. You know, you might have to quit Spider and go back in again. It returns all the cells. It might help. Okay. Okay, and then we can quit that. Okay. So now we're going to go on to uh, plotting some pretty pictures. Okay. So we're gonna. We now want to. Yeah, yeah, and Google Colab, everything is fine. Okay, now we want to redock. Okay, we're going to redock. Where's the spider? Okay, so we, yeah, can you see here we've redocked? And let's just quit. We're going to quit the console to start again. Okay, so if I move this over a bit more, it expands a bit. Okay, so now we're going to start writing programs. Okay, so we're going to use the editor window. Okay, at the top, you can see we've got a, a comment there. So the first one is just, this is going to be a simple plot. Okay, so that's a comment. Now, when we write programs, we're between these uh, three triple quotes, we can write anything we want. So this is our first, our first plot. I can imagine if this was a long program, you know, you give a written description of what's going in, you know, what's going on in this uh, pretty pictures. Pretty pictures. Okay, so you, you know, you could write, you can write whole paragraphs in here explaining what your program does, but we, we don't really need that. Okay, so when, beginning, do we get a copy of notes of all recording? Emma, um, you, you can download a copy of the notes through the IMA website and a recording will be available to you. Yeah, uh, We're just in Spider. So if you don't download Spider from, um, you know, from Anaconda, then you should be able to catch up. Yeah, so if you launch, so hopefully you've downloaded Anaconda and you launch Spider. You sp Spider here, you launch Spider uh, and that's where we're up to. Okay, so we're going to write our, this is our very first program uh, in Spider, and it will enable us to get some pretty pictures. So we are going to import NumPy as MP. So this is a numerical Python library. Uh, it gives us a warning here because it's been imported, but it hasn't been used yet. So as we type, you know, Python is always trying to help us. Uh, well, you know, Spider is trying to help us. Then we're going to import uh matplotlib matplotlib dot pyplot as plt now you will get used to this whenever we produce any graphics these two lines are always the first two lines when we're producing any graphics and again you see you get we get a warning because we've loaded it but we haven't actually done anything with it yet now we do need to define our um we define a vector of x values. So we use this function called lint space. Okay, so that it's going to go from minus two up to two. Uh, and we'll have 100 points. Okay, so this this is a vector. Okay, so th this is similar, you know, to what you do in MATLAB. Yeah. So in MATLAB you define a vector. So the x values go from minus two to two, and there are 100 values between minus two and two. So that's a vector of x values. Then using that vector, we can get a corresponding vector of y values. So y is x to the power of two. So this is also, so this is a vector of y values. And, and this is exactly how MATLAB works. Yeah, so we get a vector of x values and a vector of y values. Uh, then we're going to plt.x label. Again, you can see this is similar to MATLAB, if any of you use MATLAB. Again, you, you know, should be using double quotes throughout because single quotes cause problems if you copy and paste. Uh, and then Y label, I've spelled label incorrectly. Label. Okay, obviously the Y label will be Y. Uh, and then we'll have plt.title. 
And this is where we need to introduce a little bit of LaTeX. So between dollars, we have y equals x to the power two. Close the dollars. Okay, now I might have time a bit. I don't know yet, but, but this is simple LaTeX. Okay, if, if you've never heard of LaTeX, I'll I'll give you the URL for Overleaf where you can you know where you can program in LaTeX. Uh, it's a very it's a professional typesetting uh, package, and again, it's all completely free. Okay, so we're going to put a title. We're also going to do plt dot plot. So there's there's a within within the map plot. In my plot lib dot pi plot library, there is a function called plot. And we're going to plot the x vector against the y vector. And then we just do plt dot show. Okay, so that's that's our first program. Okay, let's see if anyone's got any comments. In space. Uh, Patrick, the the uh, x values have to be has to be a vector. Uh, but there are other ways. Yes, there are other ways of uh, you know getting the domain values. So you can use range again. You know you can use the range uh, function again. Uh, in fact, I might have more examples later on. Oh, in fact, uh, we have. Yeah, if you look a bit further down, that there's an example with a range as well. Okay, but we'll come to that in a second. Okay, now we've got the program. Okay, the program is there waiting for us. So how do you run it? Well, we run it with the little play button at the top. And you'll see it says run file F5. So this is how we run the program. So we just hit the little play button. Now it looks like nothing's happened. But if we click on plots, you'll see there's the plot. Yep. So remember, you know, we've got help, we've got variable explorer, you know, it shows all your variables, and you can see X is an array, Y is an array. Uh, we've got our plots, and we've got our files. Okay, now we are going to save. We are going to save this program. Okay, because can you see in the top left corner? Currently, this is untitled, so we're going to save it. So just like you know, with any any Microsoft uh, things, we do file save as. I'm going to save it as. Uh, we'll go to. I've got a Python. Oh, I've got a Python folder. Right, I've created a Python folder, uh, and we're going to call this one plot one. I think I've used a capital P, plot one. Yeah, can you all see it's called plot one and I'm saving it in a folder called Python. So you may you may want to create a, a folder called Python on your computer before you save this. Okay, so let's save that, uh, replace. And now you'll see in the top, top left corner, this program is called plot one.py. Yeah, so I've saved it. And if we go to files, uh, we go to uh, documents, and then I think it was in Python. Where was the Python? Oh, where was the folder again? Python. Okay, and can you all see it's here now? So that this is the this is the folder where I saved my file, and I've called it plot one dot pi. Show is wanting arguments. Is anything else on the problem with plt dot show? Oh, is plt don't show? Um, no, it should just be plt. Oh, I've missed off. Yeah, the plt dot show should have uh, the the bra empty brackets. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, so it should be plt dot show with empty brackets afterwards. Okay, Blanca, I do not get anything when I run. Uh, Blanca, I think you might have missed the open and close brackets after show. Uh, but you can you can see, hopefully you can all see it does work. You get a nice plot there. So there's our nice plot, y equals x squared. Anybody, anybody having problems? Any problems that anyone's having? You, you can see from the screen it does work. I do not get it to run Blanca. Tell you what, Blanca, I'll put the code in the chat window. Command C. Um, command B. Okay, Blanca, I put the code in the command window. So if you just copy and paste that into the file, hopefully it will work. Yeah, so if you just copy and paste from the command from the chat window, 
into the editor and then run it. Okay, remember we're working in the editor window, not in the uh, console window. Okay, I think I'll go on to the next one then. Okay, now to create a new file, we just do, uh, well, there's a few ways. Can you all see the top left corner? Just click on this new file. Yeah, just click on the new file. It gives us a new one. So we'll call this one. This one will be called plot two. Yeah, so we'll, we'll save this. Save as plot two.py. Okay, so all, all Python programs end, end in .py. So that, that's how we know it's a Python file. It ends in .py. Okay, we can actually just copy and paste these first two lines again. So command C. Uh, command V. Okay, as I say, you know, when, whenever you're plotting figures, you always import uh, those two. Uh, in this case, we are using mp.lin space. So we've got our parameter t is going to go from naught to mp.py. Uh, and we'll have one, you know, to get a nice, to get nice smooth curves, we're going to take 1000 points. So it's a really nice smooth curve. Our x values will be 0 0.7 multiplied by uh, np dot sin of t plus one uh, multiplied by np dot uh, sin of three multiplied by t three times t uh, that's all right for that one and then we've got our y values are 0 0.7 multiplied by np dot cos of t plus one and then multiplied by np dot sign of three times two. Okay, that's the same. Okay, so that, those are our x and y functions. Then we've got plt dot uh, x label. Remember, is the, that's going to be our x axis. We want plt dot uh, y label. Y label will be the y. Um, and then we're going to plt dot plot uh, x against y values. Okay, the x and y values. And then color equals, now this is up to you. I'll, I will go with magenta. But, you know, it's green on the notes, but you can choose whatever color. We'll call it gold, purple, black, whatever you want. plt dot show with the, with the black, uh, you know, with the brackets. Okay. Can you post code? It's hard to type as fast as you. Yeah, of course, David. Right, so we do command C, command V. Yeah, if anyone wants help, you just, again, copy, you know, copy from the chat window and copy it into the editor. Uh, again, we could just run this file with the little green play button. Uh, we can see you get a lovely, um, parametric plot. So there's our parametric plot. Now again, you know you can have great fun with students uh, because I know I think they do parametric plots at A level, uh, but I, I don't think I have a parametric plotter at A level. So you can you know you can play around with these things and get all kinds of very pretty pictures and then, and then do the mathematical analysis. You know you can find gradients, etc. You know find out where the gradient is zero, things like that. You know, on these parametric plots. Okay, so, right, what about, so, yeah, Blanca, I will come to 3D plots later. Yeah, I'm going to show you, in fact, I'll show you 3D plots uh, in a few minutes. Now, what time are we supposed to finish this? Um, 3.30, it doesn't matter if we don't get over. Okay, we want another one, so let's have another new file. But yeah, another new file. So this one will be plot three. Okay, again, David, I will, I will, uh, you know, I'll type this up quickly, and then I will, um, I will put it in the chat. Uh, you know, for just copy and paste. Okay, so we're gonna again import numpy as np, uh, and then we can import. Uh, matplotlib, matplotlib dot pyplot and plt. 
Uh, and in this case, we are going to um, put two curves on one graph. So we've got MP, uh, somebody was asking, do you always have to use lint space? So in this case, we're going to, you know, a range of values. We're going to go from 0 to 2 in steps of 0 0.01. I think that's what uh, somebody was wanting to know, if you could do this. Yeah, so you'll see this is not using lint space now. We're just going to say these T values are going to go from 0 to 2 in steps of 0 0.01. So you can, you know, gives you more, but just gives you control over the vector. Uh, C will equal 1 plus, uh, C is 1 plus MP dot cos of 2 times MP dot pi, MP dot pi uh, times T. Uh, and S is similar to this, isn't it? So let's just do command C, command V. Uh, so the other curve S is uh, S is one plus a V and then sine. This one's sine. Sine is it two pi t? Yep. And then we're gonna P L T dot plot. Okay, we're gonna plot T against S. And the first kind of, uh, we're going to use a red dash dash curve. Okay, so that means red, dead, red dash dash curve. Then we'll plot T against C. And we'll use a, uh, you know, you, you can play around with this. You can get all kinds of fancy curves. Uh, uh, T against C, uh, blue. Again, you know, you, well, let, let's take a green um, da dot dash, you know, dot dash. Instead of dash dot, let's go with dot dash. Okay, so that's a, a, a red and a green curve. Uh, then we have plt dot x label. So the x label again, oh, well, the x label in this case is time, and that will be in seconds. Okay, so you can imagine this is uh, you know, an example from physics. Okay, so time in seconds. Uh, then with plt dot y label, plt dot y label is uh, voltage, and this will be measured in millivolts. Millivolts. Oh, I've missed out four points. Uh, y label, uh, then we want a title, PLT dot title is going to be uh, uh, what is it, voltage time, what is voltage time, what? Uh, then we've got um, plt dot grid true. Okay, so this is obviously you know this this is like physics, so we want to put a grid. Uh, so so it looks like an oscilloscope looks like an oscilloscope. Okay, so for anyone who's doing physics, you know you you know you can imagine this is the output from like an electric circuit or something. Then you want, you want the output to look as if it's on an oscilloscope, so we can put a, a grid on that. Now, this is really good. We can do plt dot save fig. So there's a function called save fig, and it allows us to save our figure. So we'll say voltage uh, time plot dot png. Uh, and then we'll say plt dot show. Okay, so David, let me uh, put this in the chat window for you. Okay, so for anyone who wants, you, know, you can just copy and paste uh, that program. I think I'll make a lot of errors, at least you know, with, with when I use PLT and then things like that, we import the whole libraries. Package. Yeah, Alexandra, it's, it's uh, as I say, when you when you load more than one library, uh, there can be confusion with similar functions. So you know, if you imagine with more complicated programs, you, you're loading symbolic Python, you're using matplotlib, you're, you're downloading numpy, 
you know, so there's lots of different libraries. So they they load the libraries in different ways so functions don't clash. Okay, and and everyone in the world, you know, they always import numpy as np because you just need the you just need the prefix np dot to call those functions. Okay, let's just check that this does work. Okay, yep. Can you see I've got a red dash dash curve and a green dash dot curve? Now I haven't saved this file, so let me save it. So you know, file save as. And remember, I'm going to call this plot two. Plot uh, no, this one's plot three, isn't it? Okay, I call this plot three. Now, when I run this, when I run this file, and if I go to files, you'll now see that there is a file called voltage time plot .png. Okay, so this is a fantastic resource for you to produce. Uh, like this is PNG. You can also do a JPEG. Okay, well, let's make it a TIFF. Okay, so instead of a PNG, let's run it again. And now, can you see you've got a TIFF file? Or you can save it as a JPEG, you know, in any format you like, which is really useful. What's more, we can also change the resolution. So we can say DPI, well, dots per inch is equal to, say, 500. Let's run that one. Oh, uh, no, it's not. Oh, how can I do? I'll just say, um, let me just have a quick look at the book. Um, okay, let's see. I, oh, you don't, you don't, you don't have a quotes around the number. Okay, run that. There you go, it's worked. Okay, so if we now look at this TIFF, yeah, can we just not plot? Okay, uh, is that looking a bit blurred? With the numbers? Okay, let's do DPI is 1000. No, I think it's I think it's actually when you plot it. When you plot it, you'll see, you know, by, by increasing this DPI, you get really, really clear plots. So not only can you shit save, you know, you can save a file in any kind of format you like, you can also save it in the resolution that like the PNG, maybe it's being saved elsewhere. Yeah, David, the, the file should appear wherever you've got your plot three, the figure should appear in the same folder. Yeah, so wherever you've saved your plot three, the, the you know the figures will appear in the same folder. Okay, I just wanted to show you one more thing. Uh, right, so let me uh, give you a URL. Let's get a three D graph. Uh, hold on a second. Um, do Just going to give you another quick program, this one. Okay, command C, command V. Message is too long. Oh, no. Message is too long. Okay. What you all have to do is I'll give you, I'll give you the URL. Okay, so in, in the chat window, there is a URL. And I want you go to go down to in five. Yeah, can you all see in five here? And you're going to copy and paste this code. Okay, so we command C. I'm going to create a new untitled, you know, create a new file and then command B. Hopefully this will work. Uh, let me let me just check that it does work before I do anything else. Let's run that. Yeah, okay, it works. Now, just give me a few seconds to catch up. You're going to be amazed at what you can do here. Okay, so that URL, uh, you know, this this is from my dynamical systems with applications using uh, Python book. Okay, but if you look at in five, you can just copy and paste this code, and it gives us a three dimensional uh, surface. It gives us a three-dimensional surface. Now, to make it interactive, 
in the console window, we simply type matplotlib qt5. Can you all see that in the in the if you do that in the console window, matplotlib qt5 and hit return. And then if we rerun this program, look what happens. Now we get an interactive three-dimensional plot, which we can rotate. Isn't that amazing? Look at this. It's a three-dimensional you know, surface. We've used a wire mesh that you can see through. Can you all see through the wire mesh? See what's going on? We've got contours on this axis. We've got contours on this axis. And we've even got contours you know, on the 5P, 5M axis. But you can imagine if you have to give a presentation, you know, how much clearer is this, you know, to show students or delegates at a conference than if you just got a static picture? Yeah, so, and, you know, you can even have a look from underneath. Isn't that amazing? Now, I know you can do this in MATLAB, you know, and mathematically, et cetera. But, you know, isn't that fantastic? I think you can enlarge it. You can even enlarge it. So, But my, my students love this, my, you know, when they see this and um, when, when they have to give their final year project presentations, they love producing, you know, love producing uh, 3D pictures like this to show everyone. Yeah, so did, did, it, did I just make sure everyone got that working. Did everybody get the 3D image from the painting? Okay, so did you all get the 3D image and rotate it? Don't forget that, you know, this session is being recorded as well. So, you know, you can watch the recording back over and try and get this working. Could you please repeat the steps to get the interactive plot? All right, yeah. So to get the interactive plot, you simply go to the console window and you have to type matplotlib space qt5. So in the console window, just type matplotlib space qt5. And then when, when you run the program, it gives you this interactive, you know, an interactive window. So this, this is an interactive window. And then you can, you, know, you can go from any angle you like, and then you can save it. Yeah, so you can save the figure, you know, and uh, uh, I don't know, Blanca, I'm not, I'm not sure what the QT5 does. Uh, I just know it's, it's, it's map. You can also do this in um, in Google Colab. Yeah, so, you, you, well, in Google Colab, you need percent and then matplotlib QT5. Uh, Jay Beber saying QT5 is a window manager. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know what QT5 is. All I know is the command matplotlib space QT5 gives you an interactive window um, in Python. And, and as I say, the same thing works with Google Colab as well. So you can also do it in Google Colab. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jay Beber. Okay, so I'm hoping you all really enjoyed that. Uh, you know, can, can, can I, oh, can you repeat for Colab? Yeah, okay, let me show you in Colab. So we're gonna uh, take the code, command C. Uh, let's do, go to Google Colab. Where's Google Colab? Where's Google Colab? That uh, reconnect. Okay, so I'll just show you Google Colab. Uh, let's get a new code cell. Okay, we command V. So there, there's our program in Google Colab. And here we need a percentage. Where is it? Percent. Uh, and then map plot lib QT5. So you just need, you need this percent map plot lib QT5. We run the cell. Oh, doesn't like it. Map plot lib. Oh, okay. No. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, it wasn't map plot lib QT5. Um, ah. Oh, uh, Oh, that was the command. Um, um, 
Oh god, I just talked to a quick look at one of my other books. It's not plot lib p too high. Uh, just bear with me a second. Let's try to Oh, sorry, it's this, uh, I think, it might be something to do with the um, copy and paste. Um, I told it to you too far. Uh, no worry, can you repeat for color? No worry, what should I do? Just find that out later. Uh, I wonder if it works in Jupyter. Right. Um, it might not work in Google Colab, but it does work in Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I don't know. Okay, well, we're, we're going to have a look at Jupyter Notebooks after. We'll, we'll, we'll try in Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, I think we're coming up to the uh, break time. Yeah. Uh, Blanca, uh, yeah. There will, there will be a way to do it in Google Colab, uh, but I'll, I'll show you it in, uh, you know, in a Jupyter Notebook uh, in a bit. Okay, so we'll we'll have a ten minute break. I need to give my voice a bit of a rest. So I'll see you again. I'll see you. I'll see you again at uh, what time is it now? So we'll have a look at the schedule. Three forty five. Yeah, three forty five. Okay, so I'll see you again at three forty five here. Yeah, I, I, I will show you how to do this, but you put a click an image and drag. Click in image and drag. Oh, how do you rotate? Okay, there, there will be a way to do it. Yeah, you know, you, you will be able to find it on the web. On the web, there will be a way to use Matplotlib QT5 in Google Cola. Okay, so I'll just have a break for, oh, I've only got five minutes now. Um, so um, yeah, we'll just have a break, break for five minutes. I'll be back at 3.45.
Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, just to answer the question, uh, you can you can uh, use Matplotlib in Jupyter Notebook. So I will show you that in a moment. Okay, but uh, yeah, I think I think you have to do a bit more, something a bit more with Google Colab. Okay, but you can do, you can do it in Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, just check that you can hear me. Check that everything's okay. You can hear me again. It is, yeah. Okay, loud and clear. Thanks. Fantastic. Okay, so now we come on to our um, the chapter two. So we're going to introduce you to programming. Uh, so programming languages such as Java, JavaScript, C++, C Sharp, MATLAB, R, etc., are vitally important in this technological age. Scientific computing, artificial intelligence, bitcoins, blockchain, cloud computing, Internet of Things, machine learning, deep learning are only possible because of programming languages. Uh, in 2018, Philip Bond wrote a review for the government. Uh, you, you can read the whole report here. Uh, but one of the recommendations is that every maths undergraduate in the country should learn at least one programming language. And this will undoubtedly uh, be applied soon to all of the STEM subjects. And I would argue it even goes beyond the STEM subjects. I, I think, you know, people doing humanities degrees and business degrees, they should also be learning, uh, you know, to do uh, basic programming. Okay, so we're going to use the spider, you know, we're going to use spider again to do programming. And in a moment, I'll show you how to do Jupyter Notebooks and Google Colab as well. So ch chapter one, I introduced you to console window, uh, but now we're going to start writing programs. So, you know, I, I'll show you all the buttons here. You, you can create a new file. You can save the file. You can run the program. This is all in the editor window. This is the console window, which we looked at earlier today. Uh, and, and the plots, you know, your, your plots appear in this window. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you today to three very simple programming constructs. I'm going to show you how to define functions, how to perform loops, and how to do conditional statements. And with these three constructs, you can write any program you know, to do anything. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is this def. So def is used to define a function. So within, you know, within math, within NumPy, within SymPy, we've been calling functions. So what if you wanted to write your own function? Okay, so this will be our first uh, program of this session. So we're going to call this one. So this function will be called sqr.py. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so we're going to square a number. Okay, so th this this program will be used to square a number. So we use this special uh, special name def. So we always use def when we define a function, and the function is going to be called sqr. Uh, and then we're going to square this x. Now, at the end of all of these special uh, commands, we, we need to use a colon. Okay, so we, we're going to define a function called square x, and then we hit return, and we want to return. Uh, so, well, you can either do x squared or x times x. So this is our very first uh, function. Yeah, so we're just calling it square x. We want to save this. So, you know, we do file save as, and we're going to call it SQR. So I've been saving all of mine in a, a, see there's a, a folder called Python. It's up to you where you save yours. Uh, so I'm going to call it SQR.py in, in a folder called Python. Yeah, and now can you all see in the top left corner, this is now called SQR.py. As I say, all Python programs end in .py. Okay, so this is now saved. But, but Python, okay, our, you know, our program here still doesn't know what this function is. It doesn't know what SQR. So if we're in the console window, if we type SQR, open bracket, you see it doesn't recognize, it doesn't know what it is. So if we do SQR5, you know, SQR is not defined. We haven't, we haven't run the program yet. So we've got to compile this program. So we hit our little play button. Okay, and then you'll see the variable explorer. Files. 
Yeah, so we'll just use this little SQL auto variable. Okay, so variable explorer doesn't help with, with anything. Okay, so well now in the console window, you can see it's run the file and everything is green and black, which means that the, the function, uh, the program has compiled successfully. Okay, so if where we square, say, minus six, you'll see there's no documentation available, but it does know, it does know there is a function called SQR of X. So if we square minus six, then we get 36. Yeah. So we've defined our own function and we've called it SQR. Okay, so very important, I'll put it in red here. You must run the script in order to call the function in the console window. Okay, so you have to, you know, you have to run the script. Our next program, okay, so we want a new program. So this one will be called, this one will be called uh, F2K dot pi, F2K dot pi. So this is a function, a function to convert uh, Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Yeah, so we're going to convert uh, degrees Fahrenheit into Kelvin. So we're going to define a function, and we're going to call it capital F to K. Remember, it's case sensitive. Uh, we need to give it empty placeholders. So you know when we call it, it knows what we're calling a function. Okay. So we hit colon. Remember, you always have to put colon to end the def command. Uh, so F is equal to. So we're going to read something in. It's going to be a floating point number, and we want to input. So we're going to say enter temp in degrees Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. And you can put, you know, you can put your own message in there, whatever you want to put. Uh, and we leave a gap so we put the number in. Now notice the indentation on Python is vitally important. So don't change this indentation. If you change the indentation, the program will not compile. Okay, so the indentation is vitally important. F plus, uh, we've got 459.67, is it? And then multiply by five and then divide it by nine. Okay, and then we're gonna print. Then we wanna print our answer. So again, it's up to you what, what message you wanna put. Temp in Kelvin uh, is, and now we're gonna format the answer. Okay, so we're gonna format, we're gonna have eight placeholders with four decimal places. Yeah, eight placeholders with four decimal places. Okay, uh, and then we're gonna do format the K. Okay, you get used to this the, the more times you, you, know, you write these kind of programs. Okay, so this is how we format the output in Python. We're gonna say there are eight placeholders and four decimal places. Now, you can change that. You, you might want to work to 10 decimal places or you know whatever you want. Okay, so again, we're gonna save file, save as. We're gonna call this one F2K, F2K. And you don't, need the, you don't need the round brackets for this. So we're just going to F2K. Uh, and hopefully you can see it's here. Yeah, there's the function F2K. Again, Python doesn't know what this function is. So we have to run the module. In fact, what, what I always tell my students to do is you know, in, in the comments, just say run module. You know, just you know, remind yourself. In fact, I should have done that with the first one as well. When you write your first set of programs, always type run module so you remember that you've got to run the module before you call it. Okay, so again, you can see it's run successfully. Yeah, it's run successfully. There's, there's no red warning messages or anything. Uh, so then we can just say F to K. And, and now can you all see, it understands that there is a function called F2K. And it says enter, enter the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, let's try 100. And you can see the temperature in Kelvin is 310.9278. So we've got eight placeholders and four decimal places. Okay, so, so that works correctly. Okay, so did everyone get that program working. Again, I will put it in the chat, just in case, uh, command C, command B. Okay, so I've, I've put the program in the chat window, 
in case any of you have any problems with it. Okay, so that's, that's just a simple program to convert uh, Fahrenheit into Kelvin. Okay. Yeah, I think everyone's saying that works fine. That's good. Okay, so now we go on to our loops. So we're, we're going to look at a while loop. I will also look at a program with a for loop. Okay, so this is on page. Um, okay, this page 13 out of the 17. Okay, so again, we need a new file. Uh, we're going to call this first one, uh, what do we call it? Uh, sum sum underscore f, sum underscore n dot pi. Again, you now you can call it whatever you like. So this just sum the first n natural numbers. Yeah, so we're going to just sum the first n natural numbers. Right. So again, we're going to define a function that we're going to call this sum underscore n. Uh, and we're going to tell you know we're going to tell it how many uh, natural numbers we want to go up to. Remember again the colon. Yeah, all of these you know the, the defining the functions always ends in colon. Uh, we're going to say sum, and then i. We're going to define these on one line. Remember, which we can do in Python. So sum is zero, i is one, and then we're going to say while i is less than or equal to n. And then we need a colon. So all of these special words like death and for and while and if, they all end in these colons. And, and we have this indentation, which you should not change. Well, you, you can't change it, otherwise it won't go. And then we say sum plus equals uh, i. Now this is the same. Again, you've got to get used to this. This is the same as saying sum equals sum plus i. It, it, you can see it's just shorthand. And lots of programming languages uh, use this convention. So sum plus, plus equals i just means it's the same as sum equals sum plus i. Similarly, i plus equals one, then that is exactly the same as saying that i equals i plus one. So we're just incrementing a counter. Yeah, so we're just in incrementing counters here using this i plus one. Now, you'll see that the next one, print, we don't want to print the sum you know, in, in every loop, on every iteration. So we come out of the while loop. You know, we come out of the while loop. Uh, and then we print, uh, the sum is, is, uh, and then we can do so. Okay, again, we're, we're gonna save this file. So we, we'll save this as file, save as. So remember, I'm gonna call this sum underscore n. So the sum's the first natural numbers. Uh, you can see it is, it's it's here. Okay, uh, we'll run this. We'll run the program, and you'll see that it looks like it's it's compiled successfully. There, there are no error messages. Okay, with, with the next one, I'm going to make an error. I'll make an error, and I'll show you what it looks like when you try and run it. Okay, so we want sum underscore n say a hundred. What do you get if the, if you sum the first one hundred natural numbers? Okay, let's try again. We use up arrow. What if you sum the first thousand natural numbers? Oh, what if you sum the first million natural numbers? Oh, can you see a pattern? Okay, it's a nice pattern there. So you know, it's the kind of problem you can give to your students and say, well, what do you think sum n of a Googleplex would be? Uh, and you can see, you know, there's a, a number pattern here, so they can work that out. Okay, so that that's uh, a very simple program with a while loop. Yeah, so that's our first loop, just a while loop. That sums the natural numbers. Uh, the next one, again, it's a bog standard example that you learn in programming called a Fibonacci sequence. So again, we're going to create a new, well, anyone who's having difficulties again, I'll command C. So I'll put that sum underscore N program in the chat window. Yeah, so the sum underscore N is in the chat window. You just want to copy and paste. Okay, our next new one is going to be Fibonacci. So we'll... Uh, this one is going to call, be called, uh, I'll use a little f, fibonacci.py. If you want to use a capital F, you know, then you can. Uh, I'm using a little f. Uh, so this is the fibonacci sequence. 
Okay, so again, we're going to define a function. So we're going to define Fibonacci. Uh, and then we're going to work out the first n terms of the Fibonacci sequence. Okay, uh, we'll set A and B, uh, 0 and 1. So A is 0, B is 1. So we're going to print out A. We're going to print out B. So that's just you know, 0 and 1. And then we're going to print A plus B. Because this this is how the this how this uh, sequence works. So I in range. Now we've worked out the first three, so we're going to do n minus three for the remaining um, you know, the remaining elements. Right now, let me well, make a mistake here. So a let's just put a, and then I miss out the b. Yeah, can you see I've missed out the b? So I want to make a mistake. Right. I'm not mad here. I don't think I'll compile anyway. Uh, and then we're going to print. A plus B. Right. Uh, it doesn't look like no warning messages here. Yeah, I don't think there are any warning messages. So we're going to save this as file save as. And as I said, I'm going to call it Fibonacci. Fibonacci.py. Okay, let's try and run this one. Oh, it worked. Shouldn't have worked. Hmm. Why don't they give me an error? Didn't give an error. Okay, but I'll probably give you it. Let, let's try Fibonacci. Let's try Fibonacci 10. All right. Yeah, can you see? Now it gives us an error. Yeah. Well, you know, we've tried to call a function, but there's an error. Uh, I thought it would have given us the error. Either. Okay, so uh, we missed out a bit. Yes, yeah, so let's try and compile it again. Okay, it's compiled successfully, and now we can call Fibonacci 10. And there, there are the first 10 terms of the Fibonacci sequence. Yeah, so the first term is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 plus 3 plus 5 is 8, etc. Yeah, so you can see it works. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's um, that's the Fibonacci sequence. So that's that's a, a for loop. Yeah, so we've looked at a while loop, a for loop, and now our final construct uh, is just the if elif else. So we just do a, an if elif else. Okay, so this one will be called what's it called? Test integer. Okay, so test integer dot pi. Uh, and just test the integer. Okay, so you want to test whether this integer is positive zero or negative. And so it's just you know, a re really simple program that all students understand. So we're going to define a, we're going to define a new function called test integer uh, with empty placeholder, uh, and then we want test int is equal to it's going to be an integer, and we'll get input, uh, enter test integer, enter integer. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that's okay. Okay, test int. Uh, if test int is less than zero, okay, so if it's less than zero, then we're going to print. Um, integer, the integer, whatever we input, is negative. Now we need a format. Not format, format, uh, testing. Okay, and then we can copy that because we're going to use that again. So command C because we want to use that again. Uh, so we're now in a test int. Uh, if statement. So to come out of that, we have to use backspace. So we've come out of the if. Now we enter an L if. So L if test int is positive. And then we can command V. And then we say the integer, whatever it is, is positive. And that one's positive. Uh, again, now we're in, you know, we're in this L if statement. We don't want to be in the L if statement. So we now use backspace to come out of that. And then we say else, well, 
if it's and then we can command v well if it's not zero and it's if it's sorry if it's not negative and it's not positive then it must be zero yeah and we thought about that so again we're going to do file save as so we save as and we're going to call it test integer test integer test integer that's what I called it is it here yeah there it is you all see test integer so I run the program it's it looks like it's been successful so we do test integer and it does it recognizes the function uh, enter the integer minus 456 is negative yeah minus 456 is negative so that works really okay so before we move on any questions about def uh, for loops while loops or if elif else okay so th you know those are our three basic constructs define a function for loops while loops and if elif else. What common errors do people make in Python when defining and using loops and conditions? Uh, uh, common errors are, you know, the, the indentation with, with these, with the programs, uh, yes, yeah, syntax, but also the, you know, the indentation, because quite often, you know, you can imagine it's a lot more, you have more complicated pro problems like this. And Depending where your if you know the if else if else, you are defining the function because you can have defining functions within loops and it can get really complex. So that's where that's where a lot of students make mistakes. At. And the annoying thing is that they can get the program to compile and it all works splendidly, but you get the completely the wrong answer. Yeah. So yeah. So that hopefully that answers your question, JP. Yeah. Yeah, indentation is, you know, because you can have two programs which both compile, and because you know the indentation on one of them might be slightly different, and you get completely different answers. You know, so you've got to be careful with indentation. Okay, we uh, we need to get a move on then. So now we are okay. So this is where the fun really starts now. So we're going to leave Spider now. Okay, hope, hopefully, you know, you've all had a, a good time with Spider. Uh, and Spider is useful. Obviously, uh, you use Spider when you have no access to the internet. Okay, that, that's when you use, that's when you use Spider. Then, and it should be a word with a Y. Can you edit? No, oh, good. Okay. Um, use spider and uh, no access to internet. Okay, so, so you can use spider when you don't have the internet. Yeah, so you know you can just sit in the park, you know, you can program in Python when you're sitting in the park with no internet access. Okay, but if you do have access to the internet. Then you should use Jupyter Notebooks and Google Colab, and I'll, you'll see you'll understand why now when we look at these. Okay, so is everybody ready? Is everybody ready to look at Jupyter Notebooks? All right, everyone ready to look at Jupyter Notebooks? Yeah, AJD. Okay, so we're going to leave Spider now. Okay, thank you, David. Okay, so let's quit. Let's quit this. Okay, so we can quit Spider. Uh, and Python, we're just going to quit Spider. Okay, so we're going to come out of Spider. Okay, now if you go back to Anaconda, we're now going to launch a Jupyter Notebook. Can you all see here? So we, we before we launch Spider, now we're going to launch a Jupyter Notebook. So you just click on Launch Jupyter Notebook. Now we can, we can minimize this Anaconda Navigator. Do not close these windows. Okay, so these little terminal windows open, do not close those. And you should get something like this. Yeah, you get a home page, something like this. You you probably haven't got all of this, all of the documents. 
And we are just going to, in the top right hand corner here, we are going to create a new Python kernel. Now, can you see here? It's in the notes. Open a new Python 3 notebook. Can you see there? So we're going to have this Python 3 IPY kernel. So we're going to click on that. Yeah. So we're going to open a new Python notebook, uh, Jupyter notebook. And this is what it looks like. Let's just make that a bit bigger. Just make sure everyone's got that. Okay. So have you all got, have you all got the new Python notebook open? Yeah, so have you all managed to get this new Python notebook? Nope, I haven't yet got navigator, but no, it's all right. I'll wait a few seconds. Okay, so you need yeah, you need to now you can see, you know, with the anaconda, it does sometimes it takes a while to load up. Remember, you can everything I'm going to show you now, you can also do in the Google Colab as well. Yeah, so if you have if you have difficulty getting the Jupyter notebook, then um, you know you can do this with Google Colab. Yeah, JP Horton, best to do Google Colab. Okay, David, again, if you have difficulty with Jupyter Notebooks, just, just go to Google Colab, open a Jupyter Notebook in Google Colab. You'll see, you know, it is similar to this. Okay, now in the Jupyter Notebook, you'll see that we've got all of these uh, buttons at the top. Yeah, we've got a run button, we've got file, you know, you can do file, save as, we can edit, we can view, we can insert cells, etc. And here we have code, and we also have markdown, code and markdown, and heading, but well, we don't really need the heading. Okay, so what we're going to do. Initially, we're going to change code and we're going to make it a markdown cell. So this is our markdown cell. And to create a title, we just used a, a simple asterisk. Okay. Uh, so this is our, uh, this is our, oh, we're going to um, uh, projectiles. Okay. And you hit shift enter or you, or you can run the cell. You either run the cell or you can hit shift enter. And you can see you've got a nice title. So this is how we put titles into a Jupyter Notebook. And now below it, we've got a code cell. Yeah, so the code cell is where we compile uh, code. But before we do that, I'm going to show you a bit of LaTeX. Okay, so to edit this cell, we simply double click on it. Okay, and we're going to put in some formulae. Okay, and the formula we're going to put in is, um, so, uh, so we need a bit of later. We're going to say that S is equal to, uh, which one is it? UT, UT, S equals, uh, UT plus one half. So we need frac one half, no, one half. Uh, so it's UT, S equals UT plus one half GT squared. Is that it? One half. No, 80 squared, 80 squared. Okay, now this is LaTeX. Yeah, this is LaTeX between the dollars. So this is how we put mathematical formulae into a Jupyter notebook. So if we hit shift enter, how pretty, how pretty is that? You can put, you can put ma pretty mathematical equations into a notebook. Okay, now this is called LaTeX. And, and later on, I'll show you how you can get tutorials on how to learn LaTeX. Okay, so to, to compile the cell, we just hit shift enter. Okay, because we're going to use this formula uh, in order to plot a trajectory of a of a projectile. Okay, and you can see the simple the program is quite simple. So we're going to import numpy as np. Okay, so we're going to use the alias np. We're going to import matplotlib dot pi plot. As PLT, and I will I will copy and paste this into the chat window in a second. Yeah, so don't worry, I'll I'll copy and paste this into the chat window. Um, so that's that one. 
Uh, then we're going to do x naught is obviously the initial x naught is the initial horizontal um, distance. Y naught is the initial uh, vertical distance. S y is the distance in the y direction. G is your acceleration due to gravity. D t is our you know, small increment of time, and then we've got t. So uh, x naught is naught. Uh, y naught is ten because we're going to launch. You know, we're launching a projectile from the top of a cliff of height 10 meters, say. Um, SY is uh, zero. That's distance in the Y direction is initially zero. Um, then we've got G uh, is 9.8. So G is 9.8. Uh, our DT is 0 0.01. And initially, the time is zero. Okay, so we set all of those variables. Uh, our Vx naught, so the initial velocity in the x direction is 20 times mp dot square root of 3. Okay, so that's the initial uh, horizontal velocity. The initial uh, vertical velocity is 20. And I'm going to say while uh, sy is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so while, yeah, while, while the um, particle or ball, whatever it is, is above ground. So we say SX equals, so it's just UT because, you know, there's no um, there's no acceleration due to gravity horizontally. There's no acceleration uh, horizontally. So the, so the distance in the X direction is just, uh, it's just like UT because, you know, because the acceleration is zero. And then SY is equal to uh, VY zero times T minus g times t squared over two plus and then you know initially we're at the top of the cliff uh, then we have t plus equals dt so we're going to in increment time by 0 0.01 uh, to get a nice smooth curve now plt dot plot and we're going to plot uh you know with co coordinate positions sx and sy and it's up to you what color we'll choose. Let's do uh, what color haven't we had so far? Um, um, what color haven't we had? Uh, we've done red, blue, green. Um, uh, um, we had cyan. I, th I think C might be cyan. I don't know. Well, we'll try C. I don't know what color C is, but we'll try it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post the code in a second. Uh, then we want uh, we come out come out of that, and then we want a plt dot x label. It's going to be a range, uh, and the y label. So the x label is range. Plt dot y label is y label is height. And then we're on PLT dot show. Okay, let me copy and paste this. Uh, command C on the bit in the chat window. Okay, so you can now just copy and paste that code, you know, into the cell. Okay, and let's run the cell or you know, hit shift enter. Um, yeah, oh, there's a nice cyan color. Okay, so there's the trajectory um, of the uh, ball or whatever it is, you know, thrown from the top of a cliff. Yeah. Now, I'm going to show you next how to do an animation. So if you want to, you know, later on, you can try and produce, you know, just draw a ball and then show the ball flying along this trajectory. And you could even trace out the trajectory in the background as you go along. Yeah, so, so that's a little exercise for you to do. Okay, so that's a projectile. So this is our Jupiter uh, notebook. Okay, so uh, any questions? Any quick questions about that? Um, about the Jupiter notebook? Oh, David's saying it's a local host, so why do I need internet access? Oh, I don't know, David. Can you access Jupiter notebooks without the internet? I don't know. I didn't know you could. I am. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. Okay, so you can't access Jupyter notebooks without the internet. 
I didn't want them. Okay, so any other questions about Jupyter Notebooks? So there's your Jupyter Notebook. Let me just show you now. So now you've run this program. If you want to save this onto your computer, you can do file, download as, and you can save it as a IPYMB, and you can save it, you know, in a folder. So once once you you know you've written your Jupyter Notebook, you can save it as an IP, IPYMB is a Jupyter Notebook. So you can save it on your computer, and then later on you can go, you know, file, um, open, you know, and, and then you can open this Jupyter Notebook in as in Jupyter or in Google Colab. So you can save it as IPMB. What you can also do is you can save it as HTML. Yeah, and if you save it as HTML, then you can publish it on the World Wide Web. So that, that's what I've done with a lot of my files. Okay, and I'll show you GitHub in a second. Yeah, so so you can save it as an IPY and B, or you can save it, you know, you can download it as HTML so that later on, if you wanted to, you can publish it on the World Wide Web. And, and I do all of mine through GitHub, so I'll, I'll make show you a bit of GitHub in a minute. Okay, so am I okay to move on? Okay, we've only, only got one more example to look at now. Note for collab, need to put LaTeX in between dollar signs. Um, okay, we'll, we'll have a look at collab in a second. Okay, so, so I think everyone's okay about that. Okay, so that's Jupyter Notebooks, you know, really quick introduction to Jupyter Notebooks. Next, I'm going to show you Google Colab, and I'm going to show you how to produce an animation in Google Colab, which, you know, if you're a teacher, your students will love. If you're a student, you'll see how useful this is. Okay, so we're gonna um, we're gonna go to Google Collabs. Let's just go to Google. Okay, so just to remind you all, if you use Google Collab, you need a Google account. So you have to register with Google and get yourself a Google account. So in Google, we simply type Google Collab. Okay, and can you see the first hit here is Welcome to Coll Collaboratory. You click on that and you have to log in. Okay, so you know if you if you're um you know, so, so if you're not already logged in, it will ask you to log, you know, sign in to your Google account. Okay, so we're gonna go to new new notebook. Okay, so here is our Google Colab notebook. Okay. Now we are going to, at the top, we are going to insert a text cell. Okay, we're going to uh, put a title. Oh, what's that? Yeah, we're going to put a title in. So we need our hash. Um, so we are going to do uh, an animation. Now you'll notice what's really good with Google Colab is as you type here, it shows you what the output is going to look like. Yeah. You know, we haven't we haven't executed the cell. Google Colab is giving you a preview of what the cell will look like. Okay, so we are going to animate the curve. So again, we use you know dollars. Uh, so it's y equals sine of omega times t. Uh, for um, so we're gonna we're gonna animate sine omega t for um, so t will go between naught uh, less than or equal to t less than or equal to I think it was five I think it was uh, no not t omega okay so this is omega okay so can you see straight away Google Colab is showing us the output. So you you know, as teachers, or the, if any of you are teaching, you can see how useful this is going to be. You know, you can create all your own examples and then you know, create a website and put all your examples on the web. And then your students can just go on the web and look at all your examples. Yep. So we're going to animate this curve. All right. So this one is now a code cell. This was a code cell. Okay. Now we're going to 
uh, copy all of this. Uh, we're not due to stop for another half an hour. So again, if you're not too happy, you know, if you're not happy typing all of this in, if you just wait a few seconds, can you advise? I don't get the split screen real time update. Can you advise? Um, all I can think, AJD, is your, you know, you should be in a code cell. Yeah, make make sure it's a code cell and not a. As a it has to be a text cell and not a code cell. So make make sure this cell, and you'll you'll know it's a text cell because it's got all of these. You know, you can insert pictures and things. Yeah, so this is a text cell, and it's when you're in the text cell that you get the, uh, you know, you get the. Um, uh, what, what's, what's going to be published. Yeah, so it has to be in a text cell. And, and you, you get, uh, yes, that was it, thanks. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're going to go back to a code cell. So this is our code cell. Okay, so as I say, you know, you can just watch me type in. Uh, um, if you just wait a second, you can, um, you know, you can just copy and paste in a minute. Okay, so we're going to import matplotlib dot pie plot as plt now obviously the more programming you do the the more quickly you will be able to you know type all these things in okay so from that plot lib we're going to import animation and rc and then from capital i capital p python dot display we're going to import HTML. Okay, I'm going to leave a gap there. So, so there are all the libraries and modules we need to import in order to get this animation. Okay, we're going to set up our figure. So fig and then axe will equal plt dot subplot subplot. Uh, and then we want plt dot close. Okay, what well, once you've done this. You know, you you don't have to retype all of these lines. You only need to edit a certain number of lines. Uh, so this this is one that you will need to edit if you change the example. So this was where we set the domain and range. Okay. Now, obviously, if you if you create a different animation, you know you probably have to change the domain and range. Okay. So we want x dot set the x limit. So our x limits are going to go from 0 to 2 uh, times n pi, np dot pi. Yeah, so, so in this case, you know, in this case, um, the x-axis is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. The y-axis, ax dot set, uh, ax dot set underscore y lim. So the y limits are going to go from minus 1.2 up to 1.2. You know, you, you can change those if you like. Uh, then we're going to set the line width. Okay, so set line width. Now, now hopefully, now you can you can start to see why these uh, you know comments are so useful. Line is equal to ax dot plot. Uh, that's an empty list. So this that's an empty list. If you have just have square brackets, that's empty. And that's empty. Uh, uh, line width equals two. Okay, so the x, the x ordinates and the y ordinates initially are just empty. Uh, then we're going to there in it. Okay, so this this in it just means it's like, I think this is just like the background line dot set line dot set underscore data. Uh, the x's are empty and the y's are empty. Uh, and then we return return line, uh, and then we have to come out. So we come out of that definition, and we want another definition. So def animate uh, n. So now we're going to have n frames. So okay, whenever you make an animation, it's made up of figures. Yeah. So you know, made up of. Uh, figures and you put one on top of the other. Okay, so we want x equals np dot lin space. You know that this is our uh, so x is going to go from naught to two multiplied by np dot pi. 
uh, and we got up 100 points. Yeah, so that's all, you know. So it, what now we're doing for each each picture, yeah, so we're, we're generating these pictures. MP dot sin, uh, and then 0 0.05 multiplied by n multiplied by x. Okay, so because we, are, we remember one our, our own, we get to go from 0 to 5. We do line dot set uh, data, and then we've got the x and the y value. Okay, and then we return uh, the line again. Okay, and now this uh, again, you don't now you don't have to you don't have to uh, edit this simply change the animation. So we have anim equals animation animation dot funk funk uh, animation. And then we have fig. Oh, fig animate init funk equals init now frames right um what you can do here you can use a backspace to split the line okay so you know when, when you've got uh when you've got long lines of code you can split it over a few lines using backspaces uh interval Interval changes the speed of the animation, and we just have this B list equals true. Okay, and then we want RC. Uh, we're nearly there. Animation, and then HTML equals this. Just make sure it works in Google. SH to and out. And then finally, adding. Okay, now believe me, I know it was a lot to type in, but I'm sure you'll agree. When you run this, you'll see it's worth all of the effort. Okay, so I have now copied the code into the chat window. So let's try and run that. Let's see if it works. So you, you can simply copy and paste, you know, from the chat window into the cell, into the code cell. It's taken a while to compile. Spin wheel. Looks like, oh, it's worked. Fantastic. Worked first time. Okay, so let me just uh, put this on reflect and I'll play. So this is the sine wave, you know, when we change the, when we increase the frequency omega. So omega goes from zero to five, and then omega goes back from five to zero. So when omega is zero, you know, you get sine of zero, which is just zero. So we just get the line, y equals zero, when omega is zero. Yeah. Now, hopefully, you, know, this is, you can imagine how much fun you can have with this, uh, with students. Uh, there is there is an exercise for you. Uh, where is it? Here. If you look at 2.7.2, you know, it says write a Python program that animates a parametric curve. <laughs> yeah, animates a parametric curve. Uh, I'm sure you'll be glad to know that the solutions, you know, the solutions to the exercises are here. So here's the solutions. Uh, let's see, where's the parametric one? Uh, parametric? Chapter two. Oh, it, it, it is the parametric. Yeah, so here's the parametric curve. Um, you know, so 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 you can have a go at this in your own time. And obviously, if you get really really stuck, then you can have a look at all of the solutions. And I'm sure you've seen these kind of uh, curves before. Um, okay, I just want to make sure you've all managed to get the animation working. So did you all get the animation to work? Did you all get the animation? All good, yes, thank you, yes. All good, yes, yes, everyone's getting it to work. Okay, now obviously, 
you know, in order to understand fully what's going on here, you have to have a go at the exercises. So if you have, if you have a look at the end of chapter one, yeah, there's a, you know, there's a lot of exercises here at the end of chapter one. Uh, Patrick, what do you do to make it work? Patrick, you just hit the little play button. You see the little play button here? So let me stop it. Um, you just hit play and you, you can either do it once, you know, you can do the animation once. So I'll just show you Omega goes from north to five. Or you can loop, or you can reflect. You know, reflect is when Omega increases and decreases. Have you got the starting image play pause buttons? I don't have that. Uh, Patrick, you, you should have got, uh, you know, make, make sure you've got this. Well, did, did you copy and paste the code? If you copy and paste the code, it should work. And remember, remember here, we're in Google Colab. Yeah, so Patrick, we'll be using Google Colab. We're not in a Jupyter Notebook, this is Google Colab. And code compiles the first image appears. Okay, but you can see it does work rather well. Okay, so as I was saying, there are exercises for you to try, you know, in order, you know, it's no good just sitting and listening to me and, and copying the code. In order to fully understand what we've done today, you must have a go of these exercises yourself. Yeah, uh, you know, you can see the kind of questions that you've got. It, it co covers everything we've done today. Uh, and if you get stuck, then you simply look at the solutions which uh, you know is, is our web pages. Now I did promise to show you GitHub. Okay, so if um, right, we can do file. Can you all see it says save a copy in GitHub? Can you all see this? Save a co copy in GitHub. So if you click on that, uh, schools of oh, branch. Right, well, you have to set up GitHub first. I'll just show you some of my GitHub. Uh, what is one? Uh, so let's say, um, uh, uh, GitHub. Okay, so here is a GitHub repository. Uh, this this is me here. Um, so this was for uh, CRC Press. Uh, what is my yeah CRC Press? So this is for the CRC Press book. So if you click on that, and you can see here are all the files for that CRC press book. Yeah, so you, you go to code and you can download, can you, can you all see it says download zip? You can download all of my Python files, my Python notebook files, everything. Uh, and let me just show you uh, the other one. So it's a uh, wrench. Okay, and here you see it says web pages. Uh, these are my web pages. And in order to run web pages, you need an index. Now, where's my index file? Uh, index. Can you all see index.html? So, in order to set up your own web pages, you have to have an index file. Yeah. So, you have an index file. And here you can see you get the you see here you get the URL. So so within GitHub, you know, you, you can set up your own web pages. Okay, but you can easily find a video. You know, you can look look for videos, look for videos uh, for setting up your own, own web domain. So you can use you can use GitHub, uh, as I said, with the uh, you know with with this you can do file, um, and you can save save a copy in GitHub, and then and then you can make it ac you know accessible. So that's what I've done with my books. Yeah, you, know, you can just use GitHub to share share files with everyone. Okay, we're coming up to twenty-two. Um, I I hope you've all really enjoyed the day. Um, you know, has anybody anybody got any questions before we 
are there any questions? Uh, have you all enjoyed? Have you all enjoyed the day? Have you all enjoyed? Thank you. It's been really informative. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, thank you, G. Now, now you know um, you can. Uh, you've got a lot to work on now. Yeah. Get a bit lost that time, but generally okay. Yeah, David, there will be a recording, so you can go, you can go through all of this again. Yeah, and 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 obviously you should try try the exercises. You know, if, if you can have a go at the exercises, this will show you you know what you've learned. Yeah, thank you, Taru. Thank you, David. Thank you, Freya. Thanks, Alexander. Thank you, Blanca. How do you start? Oh, the square root of minus one. Uh, Blanca, let me just show you um, what we're in here. Let's go to uh, code. So, Blanca, you can you deal with complex numbers. Uh, I think you have to uh, from SymPy import star. I think I think it's within symbolic Python. If you do Z equals three plus uh, four J. Let's call that Z1. Z1 equals three plus four J and Z2 equals a five minus J. Let's see if that works. Nope, uh, J is not defined. It might be, okay, let's try I, or it might be capital I. No. Nope. Oh, uh, the lie is not going to change. Oh, J is not defined. Uh, is this Simpy? Uh, um, or is it NumPy? Uh, I thought it was symbolic Python. Hold on. I don't know what it is. Right. So this is my book. I do complex numbers. Bear with me a sec. I do complex numbers. Complex numbers. I thought it was in symbolic Python. There you go. There you go. Right, is it in Simpy? Simpy. Yeah, there is in Simpy. Can you see see this here? Okay, so Z1, Z2, plus three plus one J. Oh, yeah, it's on it now. Okay, and then you can do, then you do, you know, complex arithmetic two times Z1 uh, minus four times Z2. Can you see? Uh, who was asking it? Plan Blanca. Yeah, Blanca, you can do complex. It's, it's in my book, you know, how you work with complex numbers. Uh, you know, you can do the absolute value of a complex number. You know, all, all the uh, and you can expand complex numbers, etc. So it is explained. So yeah, you can work with complex numbers. Uh, another example is you can plot the Mandelbrot set. Uh, where's that other example? Okay, you, you know you, you can plot the Mandelbrot set and do all kinds of things. Thank you for everything. I have to go now. Thank you, Alexandra. Okay, yeah. So is it? Yeah, J J is the symbol for square root of minus one. Yeah. Returns as expected. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else got any questions? Well, we will be given the opportunity to give full feedback. Yes, Patrick. The I, the IMA will ask you for feedback. Yeah, the IMA will ask for feedback. The IMA will request feedback. And, and as as Maya said, uh, you can also get hold of a certificate of um participation
Yeah. Where can I read more about long short term memory for stock market? Your book, obviously. Any others? Uh, JP Horton, if you look on the internet, there's lots and lots of resources. I'll just show you the pages from my book for that. Long short term memory. Um, where is it? So long short term memory is transfers near the bottom. Uh, and there are, there are references as well. I think I'll, I'll show you some references in the in this book. Um, long short term memory. Um, that works. Long short term memory. Okay, so here's the here's the section. So you can do long short term memory, recurrent neural networks to predict chaotic time series. So this is what the long short term memory looks like. There's a description, and you know, there's a full working program here. Okay, so this, this is uh, the logistic map predicting the chaos in the logistic map. Uh, and then we've got long short term memory to predict, you know, financial time series. So this is the US euro exchange rate. Uh, and then at the end of the chapter, there are some references. So uh, JP Horton, you know, the, you can see here, uh, there, there are some references to long short term memory. Uh, if you if you want to do a screenshot of that page, you can see there's, there's uh, you know, some books and there's also journal papers. If you want to do a quick screenshot of that. You know, so, so down here, accurately forecasting stock prices using long short term memory and GRE, GRU neural networks. Yeah, so, so, so um, yeah, don't thank you. Okay. Yeah, but but my book does explain, you know, I, I try to explain this in, in as simple a way as possible. And if you want to know how neural networks were, but I'll just show you this bit. Because uh, I had a look on the internet, I remember when I was trying to learn this, I could not find a simple explanation of how the back propagation algorithm worked. So I wrote it myself. Yeah. So again, if you want to do a screenshot of this, uh, this is my uh, explanation. Yeah. So here's my explanation. You can see it's quite short of how the back propagation algorithm works. Believe me, if you look on the internet, nobody gives a really clear explanation of how it works. So I've, I've kind of invented a way to, you know, to explain the back propagation algorithm uh, in a simple way. Uh, Blanca says, one question, MATLAB is strong for numerical linear algebra. What's the libraries if you know that should be used in Python for numerical linear algebra? I'm not sure, Blanca. Yeah, again, but if you, if you look on the internet, somebody will have answered that question because I know other people are interested in that. So, ju so just to ask, you know, Python stroke MATLAB comparison for numerical linear algebra and people will have written 